Be like her, else you need more coffee. Hello, good morning and uh, welcome here to the building of the European Economic and Social Committee where we have a beautiful day because there are young people from all over Europe, I think, present here in the, uh, in the room. Uh, and it's a special day because today we're going to talk about skills, we're going to talk about jobs and this is your opportunity to tell Europe what you think is important that Europe does to help people like you and other young people to get the jobs that they want, to learn the skills they need for that job uh, and make Europe so that it is good for you as well. Um, this uh, event is organized by, by the European Commission and the European Economic and Social Committee. If you don't know what that is and what's the difference, that's absolutely fine, because only very few people in the world know that. Uh, and we're going to talk specifically about skills and why. Well, that's because we just had the European Year of Skills. If you haven't heard of that, we're going to tell you all about it and why it's important. Um, we have people here in the room. That's nice. Say hey. Yeah. There are also people in the room below. Say hey. Yeah, we don't hear you. And there might be people at home uh, also watching the live stream. Say hey alone at your computer. Yeah. Um, for uh, if you talk, microphones right now. Especially Mister in the white T-shirt. Stay uh, stay away from the microphone. Uh, use the microphone. Uh, you can touch this button. Else, stay off it. Little children. Yeah. Um, um, my name is Roger Elshout, or just say Roger. I'll be your moderator for today, and it's my job to get you to the program today. I'll be speaking mostly in English, probably a little bit too fast as well. I'll try to slow down. Uh, if you want to listen or speak in other languages, you can. We have translators. Uh, oh, we have translators everywhere. I have to speak closer to the microphone. We have translators around, and they can translate what I say. So you can hear it, but also if you want to speak in a different language, they can translate for you. Um, there's these buttons before you, you put in your earphones in the system, you put them on, and then if you go to channel one, uh, you hear uh, German. If you hear press two, you hear English, Francais, uh, trois, Italiano, uh, quatro, uh, cinco is Espanol, I don't know Portuguese, on six. These are the language that we have. Um, they're available in this room. They're available downstairs. Uh, the web stream is only the language that is spoken. So hopefully people speak languages that you speak. Um, what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to meet a lot of champions. There are nice competitions. There's the Euro skills. There's the World skills. There's the Ab Olympics. All competitions where young people compete who is the best in skills. It's like the Olympic Games for sports or the Nobel Prize for science. This is for skills and we're going to meet some of the champions and we're going to ask them how did you win and why is it important that we do this and what do you think that the EU has to do to make Europe better for learning skills. Um, we're also going to talk about European Euro skills and what the ESC does um, and then we have the European Commissioner uh, and the President of the ESC um, they come sit here and they will discuss with you what they think is important, but also you, this is your chance to tell them, I believe Europe should more do more this or less that. This is your chance to influence them and help them also because it's their job and they need to learn from the experts and that's you. Uh, well, and then we have a break and after a break you, there will be workshops, there's an exhibition and of course the most important thing of the day, lunch. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, uh, and you can uh, join our conversation, um, if you're in this room you can also talk, but also if you're in the room downstairs or at home, through our very digital interactive interaction system, so take out your phone, that you put on silent already, so take out your phone, and uh, you can, uh, can we put on, on the screen, we use Slido today, you see a, a QR code on the top left, and if you still have to train your digital skills a bit, you can also just go with your browser to slido.com and it asks for a hashtag and you do EYS. But you go or you scan the QR code and then questions will appear on your phone. And the first question is, where are you from? And we see people from, oh, Hungary is going to get big. Croatia, Romania, so people from Luxembourg. Well, let's see where you're from. 
During the program, questions will appear on your screen, but also you can ask, uh, you can use the Q&A function, and there you can ask questions to the commissioner or the president, or uh, say, give a comment, and the most interesting ones we will filter out and see. So we have people from, oh, even from outside the EU. Uh, we have people from Slovakia, from Sweden, from Lithuania, Bulgaria, Italy, the Netherlands, uh, and also Netherlands, without the, Finland, Hung but many people from Hungary. Where are your people from Hungary? Say yay! Okay, you're big on screen, not really loud, yeah. Um, okay, um, can I see, um, and this is also in room five, just put your hands up, you can see each other. Who is this the first time in Brussels? Okay, many people have been here, half, half. Um, who is it the first time that you will speak with the European Commissioner? That's for most of you, yeah, well, it's a unique moment. Um, who knows exactly what the European Commissioner is? Okay, he might need to explain himself a little bit, yeah. Um, I would like, um, uh, if I can choose, I want to work for a boss, so I have a salary and just be an employee. I like to work for a company or an organization. No, very few, some people, yeah. I want to be my own boss. No other boss, yeah, oh, there are own bosses, yeah. There are some, or I want to be the boss of a big company. No wanna be Elon Musk's here? Oh, one, one, yeah, very good, yeah. Uh, I want to be a politician. No one? Okay. Well, then it's good that we have the European Commissioner who does it for you, yeah. Um, I am going to vote this summer for the European Parliament. Okay, most of you, that's very important. Um, I liked being in school. Ooh. Half, okay, so half think school should be better, yeah. Um, I sometimes worry about my future and if I have a good job in the future. I sometimes worry about my job in the future. Okay, that's more than half of you, so it's good that we talk with the commissioner today. Okay, um, then we have the next question on Slido. Can we put it on? That is, what is a skill that you have? Can we put it on the screen? What is the super skill that you have or would like to have? Yeah, and you can... The first one is cooking. Oh yeah, that's very important. <laughs> Flying, that's difficult yet. Uh, woodworking in Dutch, I see mathematics. DJing, communication, plumbing. Oh yeah, that's good. Mind reading, invincibility, to stop time. Dancing, drinking, <laughs> see the future, and megatronics. Well, we're going to learn what that is. Okay, um, good to see that we have a lot. Feel free to keep asking your questions. Well, later in the program, we will use them. I am going to our champions. We have a lot of champions in the room. Some are sitting here, and I'm going to ask them how they won and why it's important. I'm going to get seated for that because else you have to twist your neck and it's maybe not a skill you have. So, um, first, next to me, we have uh, Stefan. Hi, good morning. Uh, you are the uh, World Skills Special Edition for, you won the World Skills Special Edition for Automotive. So a special competition for people in automotive. You prepared really well for it. You even went to the Emirates to get some good skills. Why did you go to the Emirates? Yes, so hello to everyone. Yeah, it's important to being trained before the competition because like every fault or every mistake you make before, you didn't do it during the competition. So I ha had the big luck that my uh, Trainee, uh, my trainer said to me, okay, we have a chance for you to make some friendly competitions in different countries. I had for me, myself, the training during my work <laughs> already, then after the work, then we had uh, many weeks of only training with my trainers. They prepared me really well for the competition. And then they said, okay, it's also really important that you uh, make like 
the uh, friendly competitions where you make the competition on or where you train under competition mode. So like you're staying under pressure, you're having the time in your neck and you know, okay, you have to uh, work now really pre uh, precise and also with the time. And then already you see like the level where you're standing, like yeah. in the United Ar Arabic Emirates, for me, it was a big push. I realized, okay, if I want to get world champion, I have to do now a bit more like you are from the the car company, uh, the car country in Europe, Germany, but you had to compete with people from China and Japan. Was that more difficult? <laughs> yeah, of course, that's really uh, difficult there. Like in the Asian countries, they are more focused on the trainings. They are competitors like in special training centers half year before the competition. So for them, it's really like a drill that they have to win there. <laughs> So how did you beat them? What did you do? What's your secret? I think the secret is like in the vocational education in Germany, you're being prepared for every task. It's like in other countries, they are staying like in special education centers and getting trained there only for those competitions. And like in Germany, with the vocational education, you learn everything about the cars. It's not that you learn only about some uh, special faults or something like this. It's like that you're getting trained on everything with the cars. So like you're a bit, um, you're knowing everything about and not only about some stereotypes. If you have this fault, then you should do it and this or that. So, okay. so there, there's good hope for Europe. We still have, we still do some things better. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then you won the world skills. Then I think the next day, uh, BMW, Volkswagen, Porsche, Mercedes, they all called you and said, come work for us. Yeah. During the uh, training and even after the world skills, there were many newspapers and something like this. And also they asked me the same questions. And every time I said to them, okay, during I made uh, the uh, gymnasium and after this, for me, it was the decision, okay, going for vocational education or going on the higher education and like studying or something like this. But every time I said, my dad has uh, his own garage with his two brothers and some employees. And for me, it was a dream to go later or to later took over of the company. And then they asked me, yeah, why? you know, win the world skills, why you wouldn't go in the bigger company. And that's also like after the gymnasium, if I would go on higher education level, like in university, this wouldn't be the job which I fell in love. So you rather work for your own family company than a big company and be your own boss. Yeah, it's like the job in the end of the day, you're finishing something, you're helping people. You had also during the day, some small like competitions. If you think about fault finding, troubleshooting, like that's every time like a small competition and you beat against yourself. <laughs> much more interesting. Thank you so much and good luck with uh, running the family business for another 50 years. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, and then we have uh, Sylvain from, uh, uh, from France. You, are, you won the Abel in, uh, uh, in floristry. You are one of the best florists uh, in the world. What is your secret? Hello, everyone. Um, I think the, the secret is just the preparation and the mental, prepa the mental preparation because um, my coach um, work hard to, to um, because she want, uh, I want to become the best uh, version of myself, a pro professional version. So I work hard, uh, a lot of training, um, and I think mental preparation is um, more important to resist for the, the pressure. And uh, now... Yeah, now it works. You even wanted to become a teacher now. So you, now got, you learned the skills first, now you teach others. Why is that so much fun? Uh, since the competition, I... Um, I, I teach some skills, so because uh, my coach uh, is very, very generous, and uh, so now it's uh, my turn to share my skills, uh, share my experience, and uh, I really like um, that. Yeah. Wow. 
It's a difficult system. Yeah, good. good. And uh, you won the Abe Olympics. That's a special competition for people with a disability. And I said, is it important to focus on it? And you said, no, 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 that's re we shouldn't focus on that. We should focus on something else. Um, yes, in uh, Abe Olympics competition, the more important is uh, passion, uh, determination, and uh, the competence. But um, because um, uh, in March, uh, we just uh, see passionate people and not disability. I think uh, it's uh, difficult, just uh, difficult, that we have solution to win. Yeah, applause for that, that's really nice. I, when we spoke earlier, even said, we all have something strange, that's, just look, that's for everybody, just look at the passion. I thought that's well, beautiful, we should put that on the wall somewhere. Thank you so much uh, for this. Um, Gary, uh, you won, you're from Spain, and you won the uh, mechanics and 3D printing a competition, yeah. Uh, what is your secret? Yeah, so, and feel free to speak in Spanish. Yeah. I am going to speak in Spanish, but because my English is not the best. And sí, eh, la verdad que muy contento por haber asistido a la última edición del, del Euro Skills y la verdad que fue un placer disfrutar allí con todos los participantes, competir porque detrás de todo esto hay un gran trabajo, hay muchas horas de trabajo detrás de pues, tanto con tutores como con los expertos, con todos los que te enseñan y la verdad es que, <coughs> que perdón, el secreto está un poco en eso, en que hay que sacrificar muchas cosas porque por ejemplo yo por las mañanas estaba trabajando en una empresa como mecánico y es cuando Es, es cuando por la tarde iba a, a trabajar, eh, por la tarde iba a, a estudiar un poco con mi profesor y eso. Entonces, la verdad que he tenido bastante suerte de tener un profesor muy bueno y que me ha ayudado bastante. Y la verdad que sé que esto está un poco ahí, en trabajar duro y sacrificar bastantes cosas. Wow, hard work has always pays off. Thank you so much. And... You have a stand. Can we see your 3D printer at your stand? Yeah? Yeah. Eh, voy a estar luego eh, con algunos compañeros míos eh, en el stand de diseño mecánico CAD con, con una impresora 3D. Y la verdad que estáis todos invitados a ver un poco la demostración de lo que, que, es lo que hacemos. Y eso, voy a estar yo con los soportes de la impresora 3D y otro también campeón de tanto europeo como mundial. Y entonces eso, estaremos todos de agradecidos de que vengáis. And if you're more into flowers, Sylvain also has a stand where you can learn how to make the most beautiful flower bouquets in Europe. Yeah. Uh, Charlotte, you're from uh, Belgium, you're a, uh, a graphic designer. Yeah, what's the most important skill of a graphic designer? Uh, I think there are important two uh, combinations between creati creativity, yes, okay, it's working. Uh, creativity, but also uh, technical skills, and uh, during the competition also uh, soft skills, it's uh, very important things. Uh, and you also, you work for yourself, you have your own business, did you learn, do, do you need skills for, to, be a, uh, to have a business and did you learn those skills in school? Uh, during my, the schools I already have a true client, if I can say it, and uh, so I have already uh, had interactive with uh, real people, not only fictive ones, so that's pretty cool, but all uh, market management and administrative, I learned it by myself. Yeah, a lot. To, uh, not little bit, you need a lot of skills to do all that. Yeah, and then we all know ChatGPT and. Do you still have a job in ten years, or are you gonna get outcompeted by AI? Um, yes, I think uh, it's a tool. Yeah, you. We don't have to be afraid of it. It's uh, it's help for technical or long and uh, long task for do it quickly. And but uh, I think. Human is still important, and uh, the sensibility of graphic designer is still here. And also, uh, you have to combine it with uh, personal culture, and for do it uh, thing going further. So uh, I think it's important. Wow. It's like 
Oh. It's like the internet, you, we have to move on with the time. Yeah, it's a, a skill you need to learn, not a, not a competition. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Applause. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, Elfie. You won the world skills in mobile robotics, and you even have your own robot company. Uh, what did you do to win this competition? Uh, so uh, it was a little bit complicated because uh, we know just uh, two weeks before the competition we had to participate. So um, we work uh, hardly and uh, a lot uh, during these two weeks to make the, the robots. And my father, who have um, programming uh, skills, helped us uh, a lot to make a solid base, base program. And um, in the competition, we we stay focused in uh, our task and uh, not looking too too much in the other team to to stay focused. And then you won. And then I think the next day, uh, the big companies, uh, Boston Dynamics and Tesla, they were calling you, say, "Come work for us." Uh, not really, because uh, I had already my company. But I work with the company, so uh, nobody... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> They're too afraid of you to, to call you. Yeah. Well, hopefully in 10, year, in 10 years, are you going to be the biggest robot company in Europe? Uh, I don't know, but I want to, to move in uh, other country, maybe. Uh, maybe in Australia or in uh, Canada to work uh, in uh, robotics. Well, good luck. In 10 years, we're going to see you as the, the big, famous face of robots in, uh, in Europe and the world. Thank you so much. You get applause. Yeah, and then I have to send you out of the room because you're going to take some pictures with European Commissioner. So get up and uh, get your photos taken, your next step in your big, long road of fame. Yeah. And Oh, and the other champions as well. So if you're a champion, get up and go have your picture taken with the commissioner. That's, this is your chance. Oh, now half the room gets empty now. <laughs> There's so many champions. So we share this one. Yeah, share this one. Okay, so the champions are leaving the room and uh, in about uh, in a few minutes the commissioner and the president of the Economic and Social Committee will be here to learn a little bit more. What is the European Commission? What do you do? Uh, I'm sitting here with Sophia. You work at the European Commission. Oh, and we share a microphone so that the camera don't... So, the, so if it, you can put the camera on the wider angle to our... Yeah. Great technical stuff. Zo yeah, if you can zoom out. Zoom out a little. We're going to be very nicely close together <laughs> so that you have us in one frame. Yeah. Uh, Sophia, yeah, <laughs> come into my frame. Yeah. Jo okay. Join my frame. This is the first time I ever used that sentence. <laughs> um, you work for the European. Oh, yeah, a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, tell us. Tell yeah. us. It's good now? Okay. Um, perfect. You work for the European Commission. What is the European Commission? Well, first of all, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sophie and indeed I do work for the European Commission. I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so that's a complicated question that I'll try to explain to the best of my, cap of my capabilities. Also make sure to speak to us. So the ones that have these white lanyards, if you have more questions about what the European Commission is and what we do at the European Commission, we hope to be here to answer all the questions that you may have.
a question? Okay. Uh, so the European Commission is one of the main institutions of the European Union. You have also the Parliament, the Council of the EU. Uh, so we will talk a little bit about them today. And of course, the EESC, who will present just after. It is responsible for proposing new laws and policies and ensuring that EU laws are well implemented in the 27 EU member states. We have several departments, all of which are responsible for different policy areas. And you can think of it a little bit as the ministries in your own country. So for example, I work for the Department of Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, which could be comparable to your Ministry of Labour or Employment, depending on how you call it uh, in your country. And that department, or DG, as we usually call it at the Commission, but I'll try not to use those type of wordings here, because I understand that we know them because we hear them all the time. But when I first started, I also had no idea what they meant. So department, and it is represented by Commissioner Schmidt, who you will meet uh, later today. Yeah. So basically, if the EU needs to do things, the Commission has to make sure it happens. Yeah, well, everyone has to make sure it happens <laughs> together, but the Commission does have to, to oversee yeah. to make sure that it does. And exactly. Some years, not every year, but some years, the EU says we're going to make a special year for something. In uh, 2022, it was the year of youth. In 2021, the year of rail, when the EU said we need to have more trains around Europe. And in 2023, they said we want to have the year of skills. Why do they do these kind of years and why this year about skills? Okay, so two questions in yeah. one. <laughs> so European years are an opportunity to highlight a specific topic or policy area. And this usually means that we have kind of a campaign to raise awareness about a specific topic, which means events like this one. It means a lot of communication. So lots of things that you see around with the European year. And the goal is really to build awareness about, a, about something specific. And as Roger said, and as I hope you all know, this year all eyes are on skills. So what we want to do this year is to spread the word all over Europe that young people and adults, of course, need to skill up to keep up with all the changes that happen in society. Okay, we're still not in the perfect <laughs> angle, keep, so we, keep, we will still we shift moving. a little. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then for why? Yeah. <laughs> for why? This is a bit of a, a longer one, and I hope a lot of you will resonate with, with our rationale and here. Uh, bear with me with, for the explanation. Um, so just, just as an example, I mean, 30 years ago, it was common for people to finish their studies, start working in that field, climb the career ladder for the next 40 years, hopefully retire in a sunnier place than Brussels. And I don't mean that their life was just this, uh, but what I mean to say is that that was more common 40 and 30 years ago than it is nowadays. Um, nowadays, when you study, the world changes so quickly that something that you may have learned in the last semester or sometimes even something that you learned the day before can already be outdated. And in a world that changes so quickly, there is something that is essential to making sure that we can grab those opportunities. And that is, of course, skills. So we're on a mission to make sure that as many people as possible have the right skills for the jobs of today and tomorrow, which is a catchy sentence that does have a meaning. Uh, so just in terms of what that meaning is, most companies in Europe are struggling to find people with the right skills. And this exists in several types of jobs. So if we look at traditional jobs, which a lot of you have here today, such as drivers, plumbers, we saw several here uh, in the Slido, we see that companies are struggling to hire people with those skills. There are less people to work in these specific jobs. But on top of that, we have the so-called new jobs, which emerge, for example, linked to new di the new digital world, like, for example, software developers, robotics, the 3D printer. I mean, this didn't exist uh, that long ago. So, of course, we need new skills to follow these new jobs that are in the market, but also, so there's the digital side and also the green side. Of course, as we have more demands for a greener economy to combat climate change, we also have new jobs that emerge and new skills that need to be taught in order for those jobs uh, to, to take place. So for example, the jobs in the renewable energy sector just as an example. And on top of that, you need new skills for the traditional jobs that exist, right? So just to give you an example, it's very different to be a construction worker today in 2024 than it was in 2010 or in 1950, of course. And of course, construction workers already existed because they will have to work with equipment that is much more technologically advanced. And they will also, for example, have to set up solar panels, which are much more in demand now than they were 20 years ago. And this has to do with these digital changes and these green changes. And maybe just a final example is some, something that's maybe more common to all of you here, which is 
teachers. Of course, there's a lot of things that can be said about teaching and the changes to teaching. But of course, there are new skills that need to be learned on the job, but also changing with the world. And we mentioned here quickly ChatGPT, I think, with one of our, with one of our champions. And of course, this has also impacted the profession of teachers and also students. And there are certain skills that, because of artificial intelligence, have become even more important. They already were, but they are even more important, such as critical thinking and adaptability. And this will change the way that our world works, the way that we study, the way that we work, the way that we find jobs. And uh, so this is why we have a European Year of Skills. It's all because of this. It's very important to have it now. And basically what we need is to skill up, to keep up with these changes and to make the most of the opportunities. Wow. And so what then does the, the EU do to make sure that everybody knows this and does it? Well, well, as I mentioned, of course, we have the campaigns, but speaking more specifically about the European Commission, uh, the European Commission, as I said at the very beginning, is, pro is uh, responsible for proposing new policies and ensuring that they are well implemented in all EU member states. In the area of skills, the Commission doesn't decide. It suggests, okay? This is important. So our action focuses on telling countries and stakeholders what should be the ideal and helping to make it happen with, for example, EU funds. Uh, one of the things that the Commission is, is, uh, usually does is set targets and then follow it with concrete action. So what does this mean in our world? I mean, very recently we entered 2024. I hope you had lovely New Year's Eve, New Year's and everything. And you probably made a list of goals for the new year, right? Which sometimes happens, sometimes don't. We also have targets at the European Commission. Usually they're not necessarily just yearly, but we do have targets. So imagine this, on January 1st, you told yourself that you'd go to the gym more. That's your target or goal. And on January 2nd or later or never, you, can you not hear me? Or, or never, you purchase the gym membership. That's the concrete action. In skills policy terms, our target goal is that by 2030, 60% of all adults should participate in training every year. To reach that goal, we develop concrete actions, such as tool like Europass for CVs or cover letters, and EURES, which is a platform where you can find jobs, and funds, of course, like the European Social Fund Plus or Erasmus Plus, which you probably know as something else, and they help finance important okay, projects. So there's a lot of things you do. Then why today? because you brought young people from all over Europe to discuss with you. Why did you do that? Okay, so we did that for several reasons. I mean, it wasn't my, my decision, but I'm very happy to see you all here. Uh, so very quickly, um, I will address my answer, of course, to the audience. So first, we want to make sure that you know that vocational education and training programs are an excellent way to find jobs and fulfilling careers. They are a great solution to the challenges that I mentioned and to make sure that you grab the opportunities uh, linked th that were mentioned just before. So uh, please know that. And second, and of course, most important, as Roger has been mentioning, uh, we want to learn from you and hear what the EU can do to best support your skills journey. So Roger will explain how best you can do that. Thank you very much, and I wish you a wonderful event. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> and for that second thing, we're going to ask people to write it, but not before we go to the other host of today. That is the, uh, our representative from the ESC, your, uh, Katrina, you're, from the, you're a member of the European Economic and Social Committee and the president of the youth group. What, what do you do and what do you do with skills? Good morning to all of you. Um, yes, before I reveal what the EC is, I, I have to admit that this energy and dynamic you bring in this house is something really amazing. So uh, thank you so much for this. And please come more often uh, here again. So welcome you all in the House of Civil Society, which brings together people from all walks of life, young people, entrepreneurs, workers, activists, and many more. In total, 329 members nominated by national governments and appointed by the Council of the European Union for a renewable five-year term. So, for instance, I was nominated by the National Youth Council of Latvia and I stand strongly for a meaningful youth engagement and participation at all levels. In everyday life, we are divided into three larger groups, employers, workers and civil society organizations, but at the end of the day, one for all and all for one, we stand for a stronger civil society in Europe. Along with the main legislators, the Treaty on EU clearly states the role of the committee, which acts in advisory capacity. So why should you care? So there are two things I really want you to remember about the committee when you leave this house today. So first one is um, the EC is all about promoting a participatory EU. So basically you have a say what's happening in your community, in your country and even across the European Union. And 
it, it doesn't really matter whether you are passionate about uh, climate change or social justice or just transition or digital rights. This is a place where your voice can be heard, and this is a place where you can make sure that the policies we develop at EU level meet the aspirations of our citizens. And second thing I want you to remember is um, the EC also uh, is promoting the values of European integration by bringing together people from all across Europe, from different experiences, from different cultures, but they all come here to work together and to build our Europe more inclusive for all of us in the future. So this is our house in a nutshell. Uh, maybe um, not, not the flashiest. Yes, she was a bit too good. So, yeah, so maybe not the flashiest party in town, but certainly the place to be if you care about making a difference in this world. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and so it's nice. Bit, and if I take it very short, basically the commission represents what governments can do, and you represent more or less what workers and the companies themselves can do for our skills. We're going to have your president, your commissioner here soon, and this is your chance also to ask them or say them what you think is important. Can we have the Slido for that? And then we're going to ask you, um, what, would, what do you think Europe should do to help young people have the right skills for the jobs that they want? Yeah. So this is an open question. Uh, write some things that you think Europe should be doing. And this, we definitely, the, some of the things you say, we're definitely going to tell them to the commissioner and the president. And say, this is your chance to tell them what you think is important. So the first one coming in is scholarships, opportunities, freedom, yeah, better education, more money for education, a basic income so you can do what you want to do, helps uh, exchange, more funds, 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 so a lot of money you want. But some people also want patience, um, yeah, and some people want inclusion, visa support, a val more value for teachers, that's probably from a teacher, yeah, uh, mobility, information, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, so, so come, okay, well, we're waiting, so soon the commissioner president will come in. Um, I'm going to just ask uh, randomly, um, you there on the chair number 50? Yeah, if you, yeah, I think that's you. Yeah, uh, if, you were, um, if you were the boss of Europe for a day, what would you do to make Europe better for young people and get them to a job? Yeah. Uh, that's a big responsibility, just uh, <laughs> on two feet. But, you know, if I had to take inspirations from, uh, like, the suggestions that we gather here, uh, I would say, yeah, ban unpaid internships. No, ba ban unpaid internships. Yeah, that, that's important. <laughs> yeah, and you get a uh, applause for that. Uh, the lady at number uh, 57, if you were the, the emperor of Europe for a day, what would you do? Yeah, so what I said was more trainings, so maybe more uh, opportunities like this one, uh, I think, would... Help us also know what we were expected of. Um, so yeah, F a very important one. Uh, Number one hundred eighteen. Yeah, that's you. You were chilling. If you were the the king of Europe for a day, what would you do to help young people get the job they want? Das sag mal auf Deutsch, ist auch gut. Ja, äh, bessere Aus Ausbildung. Okay. Und das war's. It's I think they're more or less coming in. Uh, yeah, okay, so there's a big group coming in. Uh, we're going to make a little change. I think I have to move a seat as well, huh? Yeah. Yeah, oh, I have to move. Where, uh, where do you want me to go? Uh, while I move, I'm just going to ask one more person. Um, Number 131, over there. Yeah, it's you. If, you. if you were the boss of Europe for one day, what would you be doing? Yeah, hit the little button uh, below, next to the uh, pointing finger. If you hit, yeah. If you. Okay. 
um, that was a really good idea to pay the, pay the internships. Yeah, I think uh, this is something to do, uh, and I agree with these uh, points. Yeah. And why is there such a big difference between a in oh that is well paid and that is not paid? What's the big difference? Motivation, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it. We are away. Uh, stop pressing the button. Uh, we are waiting for the uh, president and the commissioner to come, but they are so interesting to talk with the champions outside. They just keep talking. So we just uh, probably have to wait a little bit, but uh, soon uh, they will come. We also have three new champions around me. Um, very glad to have you. We have uh, uh, Tamaj. Um, uh, you're going to be one of the champions. What did you win? Um, I won in ICT in Euroskills Dance last year. So together with my teammate, Joel. And uh, it's basically IT. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, uh, next to you, we have uh, Saga. You won in graphic design. Yeah, I did. Um, it was more specifically character design. What is character design? So basically, uh, you design characters for, for example, video games or uh, animation or maybe a comic, stuff like that. And yeah, it goes a lot deeper, but... <laughs> wow, that's... Yeah, this, it's such a, we need someone with technical skills to uh, to work here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm so curious. Where can we see some of your work? Because everything I draw are just stick figures. Try it here. Um, I have an Instagram page for my drawings, yeah. and also I run a small business. And there, I haven't posted much yet, but you can see a few drawings on that Instagram page too. Well, <laughs> use this moment to make some uh, commercial for yourself. What is the name of your Instagram page? Uh. Uh, spellbound. And then, I don't know what it's called, but the tiny line that goes, you know? Undersc underscore. Underscore and NYT. Okay. 
We're definitely we're all going to follow you on Instagram, and if we didn't catch it now, we're going to find you in the break and catch your. Uh, uh, we're going to follow you on Instagram and see all your beautiful drawings. Yeah, you can also follow me on Instagram and you don't see nothing. I'm too old for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, good to uh, have you all back here. Uh, I am joined uh, with uh, the, the champions. We, are, oh, we already introduced two of them. Uh, the third one will go shortly. And also I'm joined with uh, Nicola Schmidt, Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights. Oliver Rupke, you're the president of the European Economic, uh, and so, uh, the European Economic and Social Committee, where we are today. Your colleague just explained what you do, so uh, okay. that's already good. Uh, and here we have uh, Lawrence Gage, you're the CEO of World Skills Europe. We already heard a lot of champions from you. We're going to hear what is the competition and what should we do, and why is it so important that we have them. Uh, and we have our three champions. Um, we have Tamaj, we have Saga, and we have Jule sitting uh, on that side. Um, yeah, um, Mr. Rupke, you're the president of uh, this this building and where we are. You are one of you hosted. You are hosting us uh, all. Why did you think it's so important to bring all these young people from all 27 member states to this building? Uh, is it working? Oh. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> do you, <laughs> maybe you should switch it off. Yeah. Maybe then it works. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Now it works. Now no, it works. Okay. Th thank you. Very, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, good morning to everybody. Uh, you just said that it was explained what I'm doing here as president. I have to, to say what I did the last minutes is something different uh, from the from the usual business. And I ca just can say I appreciate this very much. I appreciate this very much that we bring together here so many of you of young people who are connected to educational and vocational uh, training and education. Because this is not only one of the, I think, one of the biggest events, and we are really thankful that the Commission is organizing this with us, but it's one of the events where we do not talk about you, but with you. And I think this is important. This house is about participation, about involvement. So we call it, in the bureaucratic uh, language, it should be the convening space, which means we open the doors, and I think it's, it's really a great experience to have you all here to talk about this, because skills from our point of view, is one of the most important, we call it megatrends, really to make us fit for the future. And we are talking often about uh, high-skilled uh, academics and, and uh, universities, Erasmus, and so on. I think we underestimate, we underestimate uh, the meaning and the importance of uh, vocational and educational uh, vocational uh, training, uh, because what we can see, what we can see is that you, people like you, who are graduated in, in these systems have not only, I won't say better jobs, but safer jobs. Safer jobs, almost 80% of the young people or younger people between 20 and 40, 34 who are graduated in VET are in jobs, much more than uh, other graduates. So I think this is a very good, very good argument why to highlight this and to bring you here. And the second point is, of course, we want really to value all what you have done uh, in, and what you have won in the world skills, in the Euro skills, and in, in the Abi Olympics. I think this is a perfect, perfect opportunity uh, really to, to, uh, to appreciate this and, uh, yeah, and really to welcome you here. And last point, why is this a good, uh, good house? Because we decided last year we open our doors to young people. We are an institution applying the EU youth test, which means when we do our normal work, which is not always so exciting like an event like here, but it's also important if we give our opinions on policy when we advise other institutions. Now we take the view of young people on board. We have the youth forum or other youth uh, organizations who will take part in our deliberations, in, in our opinions. I think this is uh, important. Also, if we go to, to the COP conferences on climate change, we take young people on board. So therefore, I think it's a perfect perfect location to do this. I'm really grateful that you're all here, and especially that we are here with the Commissioner and with the European Commission. And I really look forward to the debates with you, and yeah, and to see that we can uh, draw some, some good conclusions, really to, to increase the reputation and the attract attractiveness of VET. Thank you very much. Wow. Okay, so it's both, yeah, applause. <laughs> 
So it's both a day to celebrate skills, to celebrate uh, the, the champions, and also for you to learn from young people themselves yes. what's important. Uh, Commissioner Schmidt, you're the Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights. That means that you're in charge when it comes to the EU action when we talk about skills and training. Uh, what are some of the things that you're really proud of that Europe does uh, to help young people get the skills for the jobs they want? Yes, first. Well, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, Oliver for receiving us here. I think uh, here is the, uh, the place where finally European citizens meet and discuss and imagine the future of Europe. And uh, I think this is a great moment where we have uh, all these young people here who are the talents of Europe, who are the future of Europe. When we are talking about who is Europe, well, you are Europe. It's not an abstract. You are Europe, and you are contributing to our common future. So uh, I think this is something that gives a, a very strong and good feeling. And uh, I think this commission has invested a lot in uh, skills, in education, in the future of young people, because this is uh, at the heart of uh, our policies. Uh, to give every, every, or each young person uh, a good opportunity. And I think that uh, uh, you are the ambassadors of uh, this young generation with a lot of talents, with a lot of spirit, innovative spirit. And uh, I think this is the, your moment also, because uh, Europe today, the Commission, the institutions are here to recognize that and to celebrate you. Uh, because uh, uh, you are an example. And I would say to all young people uh, in Europe who are not here, who cannot be here, well, look, uh, success is possible. There are a lot of opportunities. We are there to help you, to support you. And that's about the year of skills. It's about the youth guarantee. It's about a lot of other uh, activities. It's about Euro skills and world skills, where young people get the possibility uh, to compare themselves, but also to create a European spirit. Because uh, talking to uh, some of you uh, just before we came in, well, I felt that they're, well, you're coming from Germany, from Austria, from uh, Finland, from all the, the member states, but, well, somewhere one feels that you are real European, you're real Europeans, and you want to contribute to this marvelous project, which is Europe. Thank you. Wow, wonderful, thank you. Uh, later, I'm going to ask you if you have maybe a question to the young people. We, they can send it with their phones and they can say it here. So if there's something you want to know specifically from them to help you do your job better, uh, you have like 15 minutes to think of a, of a question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I know that you are personally very much committed when it comes to, there are some young people, quite a lot of young people in Europe that, are, that don't have a job, they're not in school, they're not in training, and this is something that you're really passionate about. Why is that? Well, I have to press I, the microphone. I, oh, yeah. I'm passionate about that, but I'm also very sad about that, you know. I just mentioned that all those young people around us here, they... They are the, the strong examples, how they have seized the good opportunities, how they have shown that young people have a lot of talents, that we can be confident also into the future of Europe. But we should not forget those who have not yet seized the, their opportunity. And these are the famous needs you are referring to. And I'm, I'm very worried by that because I do not like... Eight million young Europeans just uh, 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 left behind and uh, struggling and not getting the feeling that uh, they, uh, they can really also um, realize themselves. And um, because for, for many reasons, and we have really to give them the possibility also to uh, first to, to have to regain confidence to regain confidence, because this is an essential part. All those who are here, they have good confidence. That's why they have been so successful. But there are young people who have, for different reasons, not had this opportunity. And that's why you also can convince them that there is a way. There is a way. 
and we have to support them. We have to find the right manner to show them the way, because sometimes the normal way is not the good way. So they need some specific help, some specific advice, some specific way to learn and to uh, be skilled. But I believe that every, each young person, every person has talents. Sometimes they come up very soon, very easily, very strongly, and sometimes they take time. And each young person deserves not one more chance, sometimes even two, and sometimes even three. And that's my commitment as a commissioner to work on that. Wonderful, thank you. And, and hopefully with the help of all these advisors from all over Europe today, we can even help you a little bit, do even more for these people. Uh, on my other side, we have uh, Lawrence Gate. You're the CEO of World Skills Europe. Um, why do we, we already heard some of the champions, why is it so important that we have these competitions in skills? I think the Commissioner just explained it. Um, you cannot be what you cannot see. And what we want through our competitions is show young people what careers and skills can do for them. There's this, still this misconception out there that to succeed in life, you do need a university degree. We are here to show you that that's not the case. There's lots of other careers, lots of other opportunities that can give you just the same success. And I have met loads of champions over my 15 years of involvement with World Skills now. Um, and I just know that some of them just have the best time of their lives just because they choose the Korean skills, they love what they do. And that passion, which I was referred to as well, I think, this morning already, um, is something that we want to show the rest of the world. We just want to show them passionate young people to inspire other young people who are going, I don't know what to do with my life, to choose a career in skills. I think that's the biggest important thing. There's lots of other reasons why we're doing competition, but I think that's the biggest one. It's just trying to attract young people into careers and skills by showing them other young people who have done it and who really enjoy it. Uh, in, in 10 years from now, you have winners of the Olympic Games, you have winner of the Nobel Prize, and you have the World Skills winners. They're more or less on the same level. Well, we're not there yet, but we're definitely getting there. We've gained a lot of recognition over the last 15 years. In 2005, when I bumped into World Skills by accident in Helsinki in Finland, we had 45 member countries. We currently have over 80. And we just uh, yesterday launched World Skills Africa, which is a regional competition for the African continent. So it's gaining momentum, uh, it's gaining recognition, and we really, really look uh, forward to the future and maybe in future have it at exactly the same level as uh, the Olympics because our young competitors are athletes in their own way, in their own skills. They deserve the same recognition as athletes in the Olympics because on top of it, you can only do a World Series competition once in your life. Athletes can compete again. There's also, there's, oh yeah, give it. Um, there also, you have a special competition for people with a disability. I could think, is that a good thing? Because then we're focusing on the disability, not on the skills they have. Or is it important that we have a special competition for that? Well, the AB Olympics is a separate organization from World Skills, but the aim is the same. We're just trying to show that skills are for everyone. Skills have no gender, skills have no disabilities. It's for everybody. So highlighting young people with disabilities competing and succeeding sends exactly the same message skills are for everyone and skills can bring you fulfillment in your life no matter your circumstances wow wonderful uh, commissioner last year you were in gdansk for the for the euro skills competition what did you see there what did you, you uh, what's your memory from that well um i saw first uh this passion, this motivation, uh, and this, uh, well, this also uh, spirit to compete and to do, to do one's best. I think this is uh, what impressed me, the motivation of all these young people coming together to compete, but in a very friendly and positive way. 
And uh, I think this is, this is extremely important because we want, this is about skills, but it's also about a general environment we want to create in the future world of work. It's not now competition for competition. It's to do one's best, to, do, uh, to realize one's own identity. And I think what has been done through the very different skills every young person has uh, uh, developed, uh, it's this motivation uh, to be uh, at the highest possible level. And I, I saw that with the hundreds of young people from all over Europe and even a bit beyond, uh, working and, and in a very positive and even, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, léger, uh, light way. This was the atmosphere among these young people, this light way to, uh, uh, to work and to create. This creativity uh, was uh, something which impressed me a lot. Wow, wonderful. Um, there might be some questions or comments or suggestions for you coming in. I'm, uh, I'm going to ask Sophia, do we have questions and comments coming in from the audience already? Okay, perfect. We actually have one question for the champions. So maybe so they can come in a little, but just remember that you can use the Q&A function to ask questions to everyone here in the panel. Please say to whom your question is addressed and ask the question and then it will show here on the slide. So the first one is for the champions. In your view, how can the EU institutions reach young people? Ooh, that's and in, it's, so in your own words, no, no that, that's a good one. Take some time to think about it. I'm going to uh, ask you that. I'm going to introduce our, uh, our, our, um, our uh, champions. First, we're gonna do, uh, we have a champion. One of the champions is, uh, the, uh, is a champion in graphic design. One is it in ICT and one in construction. And we have a question about that. So here we have uh, Jule, we have Saga, we have Tamaj. And the question to you is, it's on, you get a Slido question. Who of these three people you think is the champion in construction. Can we see the uh, Slido of that? So who is it? Tamaj, is it Saga, or is it Jule? Who is the very, very best in construction? Ooh, and the first votes go to uh, Jule. Ooh, some people think Tamaj. Yeah, most people think Jule. Uh, Jule, yeah. <laughs> Are you so famous? <laughs> Probably. Um, when we made this, this question, we thought, aha, this is going to be funny because everybody's going to think it's Tamaj because he's a man. You're a woman and no one's going to think a woman is... Uh, maybe are we so old that just our generation thinks that or is the young generation much more open-minded? Oh, and I have to... Yeah. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to speak in German because my English is not so good. <laughs> oh, it sounds quite good. Uh, yeah, understanding is good, but speaking is not so good. <laughs> um, ja, also ich denke, mittlerweile ist schon relativ gut verbreitet eigentlich, dass es auch Frauen macht. Jetzt geht's wieder. Ähm, aber es ist halt trotz allem immer noch in den Köpfen von vielen Menschen drin, dass es doch so der typische Männerberuf ist und einfach nicht für Frauen, sage ich mal. Und ähm, ja, anscheinend wissen es vielleicht doch mittlerweile recht viele, dass ich da eben dabei war und dass ich vom Bau komme. <lacht> Jetzt. Äh. Jetzt. Mal schauen, wie lange. Ähm, aber ich denke, das ist auf jeden Fall ganz gut, dass das so schon mal ankommt und dass es vielleicht dann auch mehr mitbekommen, dass das genauso für Frauen eben auch machbar ist und dass es einfach ein cooler Job eigentlich ist. Und war es schwierig, zu competen? in this competition. Jetzt. Ähm, also ich denke, dass es genauso schwierig war wie in allen anderen Skills. Also ich glaube jetzt nicht, dass das ein großartiger Unterschied war. Ich denke, bei jedem Skill war es ziemlich hart, der Wettbewerb, und war anstrengend. Ähm, klar, bei uns war es natürlich körperlich auch nochmal deutlich anstrengender wahrscheinlich, wie jetzt in manch anderen Berufen vielleicht. Aber ja, man musste sich halt gut vorbereiten und dann war das auf jeden Fall auch gut machbar. And also for you, the next day, there were, yeah, you get applause for that from the, the commission. Yeah, and we need many, many people in construction. It's very hard to find skilled workers. So I think when you won, the next day you got 
100 phone calls from big companies saying, come work for us, because we want the best. Nein, also ganz so war es eigentlich nicht. Dadurch, dass ich eben in einem elterlichen Betrieb arbeite und da eben schon die Firma da ist, sage ich mal, war es von vornherein klar, dass ich da dann auch weiterarbeiten werde und jetzt nicht unbedingt in eine Riesenfirma gehe. Aber ich denke, wenn ich jetzt wirklich mal woanders arbeiten wollen würde, dann wäre es auf jeden Fall, also würde ich natürlich sofort irgendwo was finden, weil klar, also mit so einem Hintergrund, sage ich mal, da ist natürlich jeder froh, wenn man dann in seiner Firma arbeiten möchte. Also es ist natürlich ein großer Türöffner für jeden eigentlich, die ganzen Skills-Wettbewerbe. And where do you see yourself in 10 or 15 years? Ja, also hoffentlich, dass ich auf jeden Fall die Firma von meiner Mutter dann übernehme und dass die natürlich auch weiter gut läuft und ähm, ja, dass es vielleicht auch einfach die Wirkung von den Skills ein bisschen mehr wird, gerade auch in Deutschland ist es jetzt nicht ganz so populär, finde ich, und ähm, dass vielleicht auch mehr Frauen dann jetzt gerade in den Bauberufen <lacht> arbeiten und sich da auch trauen, sage ich mal, den Schritt da reinzugehen. Uh, but then you don't only need to be the best constructor of Europe, you also need to be the best businesswoman in Europe. Do you have the skills for that as well? Noch nicht. <laughs> Aber ich bin also gerade dabei, ich mache gerade noch einen Betriebswirt parallel und ähm, dass ich dann hoffentlich da eben auch die Fähigkeiten noch bekomme, um die Firma dann auch erfolgreich zu weiterführen können. Super, danke. Um, Saka, ja, yeah, Applaus. Uh, Saka, so yeah, you, you won uh, the uh, graphic design and especially the character design. We just heard your Instagram. We're all going to follow her on Instagram. She makes beautiful uh, characters. Uh, how big was the competition? Um, it was way bigger than I expected. It was a very huge area and it was separated in like three different very big areas and the whole building wasn't even big enough for everything so they set up this huge tent but it was like huge for even more competitions so, yeah. oh wow and um what is the biggest thing that you got from what what did you learn or win by winning this competition um well it definitely gave me more self-confidence and confidence in my own skills and yeah it was really great and it also gave me more confidence in my English and communication with it. Wow that, that's a lot. What advice would you give to people that think I, I don't dare to start a competition because only one can win and the rest will not win and I don't want to be a loser. What, what advice do you give to people that maybe don't want to be in the competition? This is actually a really good question for me because when I went to compete, I thought I was going to lose, I was going to be the last, I was going to embarrass myself. But then I got the gold medal and I was so surprised. I It was crazy for me. And I think you should always take a, the chance if there's like this great opportunity and you think you're not good enough. Most likely you're at least three times better than what you perceive yourself as. At least I've seen that with myself and other people. And the worst that can happen is usually not even anything bad, so it's, you can do it. <laughs> Uh, I think we spoke a few days ago where you said the same. In the meantime, I have already quoted you three times to people. I say, the worst that can happen uh, is probably not so bad. May I say something very personal as well? Because we share something. Because uh, you were diagnosed with ADHD. I have that too. But I was diagnosed when I was almost 30, I think. And I tried to do a lot of jobs that ADHD is not really good for. I tried to work in a, as a civil servant that you shouldn't try when you have that. Uh, I wish, you're only 19, I wish I was your age when I learned to find a job or a skill where ADHD is not a handicap, but actually something good because it makes you good at what you do. It makes me good in moderating conferences. How, good, how important is it that we make young people very early learn that if you have something special, use it for something good? 
Um, can you repeat the last part? Uh, how important is that we make young people realize when they're really already when they're young that you have something special and you can and yet you have to find a job or a skill that where it's a, a talent because uh, a lot of people don't know where their talent is and they try to do something they're maybe not good at. How important is that we make young people understand themselves really early? I think it's really important and most people um, consider like ADHD and autism and things like this like as something that is like bad it will make you worse at everything you do but I think it can actually help you a lot uh, with things like if you're really motivated and you like something a lot I think there's the special interest part where you you do it with like all that you have and it's it's basically a superpower sometimes wow. <laughs> thank you so much you're a, you're a true inspiration at least to me but i think to very many people that have something special yeah uh tamash uh you uh, uh, won the uh the uh, your euro skills a team champion in ict that's not an individual competition you had to work in a team that's much more difficult because then you can't just do your own thing. You have to depend on your, your colleagues. How was that? Yeah, um, luckily we did really good teamwork with my teammate Joel because uh, we studied in the same school, vocational school together, and we were chosen from the same class for the competition. So we already had the dynamic for, for the teamwork. And... Um, of course, it was much easier to do the preparation together because uh, we could depend on each other. And um, there was some t uh, fields that he was stronger than me and some that I was. And um, it was uh, really good that we completed each other. Wow, wonderful. And then uh, uh, what is the biggest skill that you learned in school that made you help to win? I think uh, one of the biggest skills is to stay motivated and uh, to keep on with your goals because in IT there is a huge spectrum of of uh, jobs and opportunities but uh, sometimes it can be overwhelming to, to look at all the technologies and, and stuff and uh, we could apply it at the Euroskills also. And uh, you decided after your vocational school to continue to university. If you look at you who have done vocational training and the students who haven't, what, do you have an advantage over them? Do you see the difference? Yeah, of course I think I have an advantage over them because um, I could see all the technologies in practice and uh, have a deeper understanding of, of all the type of things that build up IT networks and systems. And uh, at university, in, especially in the first semesters, we are just learning the basics. So I could already see where it will take us, what, what opportunities it will give. So I have a more practical approach. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, if we go, uh, the question that we had, uh, can you repeat what was the question that was asked to the champions? Absolutely. Um, uh, so the question was, um, in your view, how can the EU institutions reach young people? Do you dare to answer this? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think it's important to organize events like Euroskills and Verskills because it inspires young people and also it can connect them with the, with the education system and also with the, with the skills itself. And um, also, I think mm, through vocational education, of course, uh, you can uh, show students all the opportunities and um, all the things that they need to have a successful career in their jobs. Oh. Uh, Mr. President and Mr. Commissioner, is this an advice that uh, helps you? Sure. I think this is a, a very positive uh, advice. It shows that the expectation of the young people to Europe are, are high, but uh, we have to work on all that. I have one thing to add, by the way, if you allow me. That's uh, really uh, still develop mobility, especially for those uh, in the area of uh, vocational training. Uh, now all students, uh, or many students, not all, but many students, know Erasmus. 
university students. Now, we have to have the same for all uh, uh, students in vocational training, to give them uh, similar opportunities. So I think mobility is also part of uh, learning, but it's also a strong European experience to show that uh, Europe is the natural environment for all young people. Mr. Oh, yeah, applause for that. Uh, Mr. President, you, also, yeah, you represent also all the employers of Europe and all the employees of Europe. If we do that, if we make much more easy for vocational training and practical people to move around Europe, will employers like that? Will employers be able to have facilitate that? And will it make Europe better? I'm convinced by this. I'm absolutely convinced because employers, they want the best qualified and engaged and committed employees and young people. And if they have more, expecta more experiences across Europe, I think this is an inspiring experience for everybody. So this is definitely an added value and we should foster this exchange and this mobility also for, uh, for people in vocational education and training. And here, as you said, we bring together the employers, we bring together the trade unions, the civil society organizations. I think they can play also a major role to, to have the best conditions because you're all, you're all passionate about your work. But of course, you need also good working conditions, you need a decent salary. I think all this has to be done, has to be framed, and the best place is here for social partners, for employers who know the needs, uh, the competences of their employees, and the trade unions who know exactly how a job should be shaped, how the conditions should be. So therefore, I'm, I'm glad that we have also social partners here with some best practice uh, experiences. I see also the, the colleagues from Austria with some best practice uh, examples, but across Europe, and we should learn from this. And we can only learn if we are mobile, if we go in the countries, and if we see how is it managed in other countries, and then to apply this also at home. Learn from, uh, learn from each other. Um, Sophia, do we have more questions or comments coming in? Yes. Oh. And actually, there is a... So I will uh, read the one that has been voted the most. So, uh, I know, but this one is also to champions, but I think we can, everyone can answer. So, how to fight the bad reputation of VET? Often it is regarded as a career path uh, for the less smart. And I actually see that there is another one linked to VET, here spe specifically to the commissioner. So, to the commissioner, how can we do better to recognize skills and VET better and have companies and value remunerated such career paths higher and better? So how can we better value rep, uh, a vet, sorry, and uh, how can we fight back uh, the bad reputation? This is the bigger question for everyone. Yeah. Commissioner, do you dare to answer? Well, I would not say vet uh, has a bad reputation. That, that is a bit exaggerated. But vet has not the reputation it deserves. Uh, it has not the recognition that it is absolutely equivalent. So this is something we have to work on. And again, you are the best, the best examples to show how equivalent, and even in some way what I listened to uh, our friend here uh, has said about the practical experience, uh, that that is absolutely an equivalent way uh, to learn to study. So this is, I think, uh, the way, because uh, you told you started that, and now you continue studying Betriebswirtschaft uh, and, and so on. So this shows that it is not a secondary or second row, second range uh, education. So, but we still have to work on that, absolutely. That's why also it's so important to, to have this equivalent treatment. Uh, I, I insisted before, on, on mobility, that's why uh, students in VAT should have exactly the same rights uh, as students uh, in universities. And also to show that there is not, uh, the ways are always open, the bridges should there, be there. I can uh, start with VAT and later on perhaps continue or, and specialize and so on. We have to have an open educational system where all the qualities are fully recognized. This is a mindset issue, by the way, and we have to work on that.
Jule, when we spoke earlier, I also asked you if you were the, the, the boss of Europe for a day, what you would do. And you said, I would make sure that schools send everybody to work in a company just to, work, to, to do some vocational work three years, three weeks a year. You said, that's going to help uh, to understand that's also uh, practical work is also really nice that you get to know it. How do you, why, do, why would that work, you think? I also would speak in German. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think the main problem is gerade in the Hochschulen, uh, not in the Hochschulen, in the Gymnasien, um, dass einfach die Lehrer schon von vornherein meistens sagen, okay, du bist auf dem Gymnasium, dann geh studieren. Also es wird meistens gar nicht der andere Weg aufgezeigt von der Ausbildung. Und ich denke, wenn man das jetzt, ja, also das mit den drei Wochen war ein Beispiel, aber wenn man da einfach mehrere Praktikas verpflichtend auch macht in der Schule, wo man auch sagt, okay, beschnuppert doch da mal rein in so Ausbildungsberufe, dann kriegen die Schüler das auch aufgezeigt, dass es die Ausbildungsberufe überhaupt gibt und nicht nur das Studium. Und wenn die Schüler dann trotzdem studieren wollen, dann ist das ja alles auch in Ordnung. Aber vielleicht gibt es auch einfach viele, die dann sagen, okay, die Ausbildung macht mir eigentlich viel mehr Spaß, irgendwas Praktisches zu machen, wie jetzt den ganzen Tag nur am Schreibtisch zu sitzen. Aber das ist halt einfach so ein ja, Gesellschaftsproblem, sage ich mal einfach, dass das von vornherein immer gesagt wird, wer Abitur macht, der muss auch studieren gehen. Und das ist, denke ich, der Fehler. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, Um, uh, Tamaj, you even say we have to do this even in primary school as really young kids make them experience different jobs. Why so early? Yeah, I think it's really important to st uh, start as a young age uh, to show all the students there are, there are so many there are so many opportunities that we need to show students that it's uh, you have a limited time to to show only that. And uh, I think it's important to start at a really young age because there are so many opportunities. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, Sophia, do we have more coming in? We, we do have more coming in. So I, this question here, it's addressed to the commissioner, but I think we can also hear from other speakers. Um, it is common that employers hire young people with bad contracts or unpaid traineeships or low pay. How can the EU help? Well, the EU is already helping in the way that uh, we insist very much that the, uh, the uh, hiring conditions have to be uh, Uh, have to be consistent, that uh, we are fighting precariousness. I think this is a, a very important message and also a way the EU is insisting on uh, that these precarious forms of work, uh, which were very common in uh, the past, should be uh, abolished in all member states. We have, a, by the way, a di directive on that, on transparent uh, and reliable, uh, uh, predictable uh, 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 working conditions. So this is something which should apply also to, to young people. Uh, we will, in the forthcoming weeks, adopt a directive and a recommendation on traineeships. I think we all know that traineeships are important. But traineeships cannot be for free uh, because those who are the trainees coming into a company, they learn, but they also they share. They share the experience, they work, they bring some new spirits, some new ideas to the company. And this deserves pay and recognition. So these are two examples uh, uh, how uh, we have to uh, fight precariousness. You know, we are in a period of shortage of labor in Europe. And that's why we have to value each person's contribution, each person's uh, work, and especially the work of young people. Thank you. Um, yeah, you got to... Uh, uh, Mr. President, when, when we think of, yeah, we have shortage, it's much harder every day for employers to find skilled people for their work. And I hear employers say two things. Some employers say, oh, that is really problematic because it's a problem. I can't find people. And some others say it's a good thing 
because so far we had like 8 million young people unemployed, which is, it was okay. And they said, now we cannot afford it anymore. We have to work harder and maybe change our jobs a little bit or the way we hire people or the way we train people so that it gives us more um, uh, responsibility to also work for them. Which of these two sides are you on? Well, I think there's truth in both sides, to, to be very honest. I think uh, it is important that we have people in jobs, in quality jobs. I think this is, uh, I think, uh, this is a precondition. We don't want to have, again, a situation, and we have it, unfortunately, in, in some countries still, that young people have not enough perspectives, that they don't find quality jobs or they even don't find any job. This is something we have to fight. This is, this is clear. Uh, it's true. Uh, we have now this shortage of, uh, of workforces more and more. And I think this is a big opportunity, a big opportunity to make use of all skills in our society. Also those who are sometimes neglected, vulnerable groups. And I'm really happy that this uh, competition shows world skills, euro skills, Abbey Olympics, shows that we want to have the full potential of all, of all uh, young people. And I think one, one point is important, and it was mentioned before, when we, we have to start very early in schools already, but we don't, we don't have to pave the way only for one, for one career. You have to have options. Also later on, we have to give young people the opportunity to learn something, to make traineeships, to have experience, but still to change the path, even from uh, vocational education and training, and then to go to university. I think this should be, should be the way forward. And this is, of course, the, uh, I would say, the challenge for policymakers in Europe, but also in member states, to frame the conditions that this is possible. And uh, in times of uh, shortage of uh, labor, I think there's no other alternative to create these quality jobs and quality opportunities for young people across Europe. Wow, that's great. Yeah, applause for that. Um, yeah, we have a few more minutes. Uh, uh, Commissioner, if there's something that you would like to know from the audience, we have prepared an open question in Slido so people can send their answers also in the room downstairs and people at home who can hear us but cannot talk to us. Um, is there something you would like to have the advice of these people on? Well, in a way, this question has already been asked because what is important is uh, what can we do better uh, in terms of uh, promoting especially uh, this kind of open education system, giving uh, all uh, young person uh, the opportunity to have a broader choice. Uh, this is, I think, important. That's, that's for the Commission, but at the end it's also uh, for the member states and their educational, educational system. Because uh, it, was, it has been said that well, uh, when you are in the school, uh, you are put into one uh, on one track, and uh, and I think this is in a in a very changing uh, working environment and also technological environment where things go very fast. How can we? How do you see uh, how your system, having been uh, having got the experience of educational system, how can we make this more open and more? Uh, student or young youth, uh, uh, youth uh, friendly? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. Okay, Sophia, can you open the question in Slido? So the question is, how can we help young people? How can we make a system that education is not one way and it all leads to university because that's the best, but that's much more a way like this. You can do a little bit that, do some VET, go back to university, maybe back to VET, change your career somewhere and make it really about what you want and not what about what people say is better. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, I look at the, our experts here. Uh, Tomás, do you have an idea how can we get the way that this... Because you went to university. Was it because everybody around you said, ooh, you're so smart, you can do university, or because you just like to do it? Yeah, I, I always get into this discussion that, uh, especially in IT, with um, if you finish in vocational education, there are already so many opportunities that to take a career. Most of my past classmates did that. So, um, but but also I was motivated to go to university because of a scientific approach to to IT. Also, I think uh, events like Euroskills and Worskills are a great way to show students um, that this is maybe the way of the future. Because um, of course you have to study as early as you can, 
and uh, and um, to have a really nice degree in in vocational education it's uh, sometimes it's it's a very good um, thing to have um, a bit early in your career um, Laurence, now the, the, it's often you did vocational training, my, my brother did in construction, and people said, oh, you're so smart, you should go to university. Should we, if we, if we have a lot of world skills and we see it, is it the question in 10 years going to be, oh yeah, you're smart enough for university, but are you also good enough for vocational school? Is that, should that be the question a bit more? Um, I think it should be the question a bit more, because we shouldn't oppose both systems. They should work together. Because there are careers that will fit some people for which you need a university degree because there's no other option. And there's careers for young people who will not be appealing through university because it's going to be through the route of VET. I think it's, it's, it's been a mistake in the past to have this, to frame also the minds of parents that to succeed you have to go to university. And I think that's, that's the mindset that was talked about earlier that we really need to change. There isn't one way to success. There's several ways to success. And actually, they need to suit the person who's entering those, not the system. And I think that's really the mindset that we need to change. Um, we always like to describe our competitions as career guidance alive because um, you, you see it. You can go then and see where, oh, that looks interesting to me. What is it? Could I do this? Would this be for me? And I think that's what we need to do. We just need to make it more open that those careers exist, that those routes exist. Um, I think it's a common experience for youngsters to go to see career advice at school. And it's like, oh, you're good at university, go to university. I think that's the, that's the thing we need to change is success. There's not one route to success. There's, there's different routes to success. Wow, great. I'm also looking into the room. If there's, We have a few more minutes. If there's something you want to say or advise on this, save your hand. Yeah, over there. Yeah, maybe it's also that the young people losing the aim and they didn't know the jobs like I did the gymnasium, finished with the 12th class. And if I ask them in the 12th class, okay, what you will do after the school now, nearly the half of them didn't know, okay, I don't know what I want to do now. So maybe it's also a really big important thing that, like Jule said, that uh, the apprenticeship is one of the most important thing that you're knowing before finishing the school what you want to do after. So you know for what I'm doing this, that's not only that I'm doing the school because I have to, because that you do the school and you know what you want to do afterwards. So maybe it's like an important thing if you use every uh, school year the last week where you're watching films or something like this <laughs> then if you say okay it would be organized from the schools that they had some bigger companies they said okay we could uh, make like five apprenticeship places for someone that you get like forced to go on the apprenticeship every year and then you had the opportunity to go like in different companies and uh, figure out, okay, this is something for me of which I agree with the job, or this isn't something like that. So that many people could uh, knew before they finishing the school, okay, I want to go in this direction. Like many people going for studying in university and afterwards, like it's not an vocational education where directly a job is afterwards. Like if you're going on a university, there are many studies where you could do afterwards many jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so afterwards, many of them doing some jobs where it's not necessary to studying, and so they are uh, get wasted of their studying time. And now they're doing maybe something which they are not happy with this. Okay, that's some very good advice. Um, so, Sophia, we had some really inspiring things coming in. Can you name the the most important ones? Hard task. Uh, okay, so we have the ones that have been voted the most. So of course, fair wages, um, artificial intelligence skills, more skilled teachers, training and skills up, training teachers, which is repeated, uh, vet as a demand for university, which is something that has also been voiced uh, here in the panel, uh, vet degree politicians. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but uh, <laughs> please illuminate us. Um, early input, and here that's also linked. I see here several uh, points on vet in primary school, so vet very early um, in our studying life. So these are some of the main points. 
Wow, these are some very uh, good answers. We also had a question uh, previously. Um, what, uh, what do you want Europe to do for young people? We also will print this, uh, this document, we'll send it to you, and if you have questions what it means, all the people around here, they can explain exactly what it uh, means to you. I hope it helps uh, the both of uh, you and also you very much with the work you do. Um, good luck with making Europe even better every day and have everybody getting the skills and in the end the jobs they, they like, want for themselves and we want them for Europe. Uh, and I want to give one really big last round of applause to the people who show that VET is as good as the Olympics. <laughs> and as a Nobel Prize, our champions, our champions, their champions, their champions. You are an inspiration for all of Europe and for making a new generation see completely different there, how they look to work, jobs, and fair wages, because that's important. Uh, I want to thank you so much. We're going to take a half an hour break. Then there, there's exhibition, where there are some workshops, and there's lunch. See you in half an hour, maybe, in the workshop on mobility with me. There's some other really nice ones. Uh, and one last round of applause to the president and the commissioner, and to Laurent Taus as well. Thank you. Thank you so great. much. It's pretty well, nice. Yeah, yeah. Thanks thank for the invitation. Uh, yeah, and also your team is really interested in making this great. work. Great. It's uh, good really good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much thank you. for, for thank joining you. us.
this. Test, test, test. Bravo, Pierre. German. DJ Pierre.
Okay, well, uh, hello everyone. Welcome back uh, to uh, our workshop. Uh, please take a seat and uh, we will start uh, uh, our workshop uh, with a discussion and then we will continue uh, with a game, with a card game as it has been uh, announced. Uh, first of all, I would like very shortly to introduce uh, myself. My name is uh, Kinga Yo. I am one of the members here in the Economic and Social Committee and I represent an association which is working with the families uh, in different situations. Uh, and I'm uh, from Hungary 
and I was very glad to see uh, many champions uh, coming from uh, my country. Uh, since we are in uh, this room uh, and we have uh, still interpretation, uh, when we come to the debate part, uh, please feel free to speak your uh, own language. Uh, I know it's uh, much easier uh, for some of you. Uh, you have the language selection on the board uh, and you can even listen to um, these languages uh, while uh, I'm speaking um, uh, English. Uh, as for the topic of the workshop, uh, we will discuss uh, 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 the topic of skills uh, that are considered uh, important nowadays and we will try to do also a forecast with my two colleagues uh, during the discussion what skills will need uh, it uh, to, to be in the future. This is of course very exciting uh, and uh, not an easy task but I'm sure we will come to some uh, interesting uh, conclusions. Uh, and after that, as uh, it has been announced, uh, we will do the game uh, in small groups uh, with the cards. Uh, the methodology will, explain, will be explained by um, uh, the colleagues um, afterwards. So, uh, as an introduction, I would like to uh, start uh, saying that skills are, are not just some uh, boring part of the school uh, curriculum, but they are key ingredients uh, to achieving uh, anything uh, in uh, your life goals, but also for work. And um, education and training should not just uh, prepare people for jobs, uh, but they should uh, empower us for life uh, in general to be informed and active citizens. And uh, I am mentioning this especially as this year there will be the European uh, elections. It was already uh, communicated this morning and uh, uh, some of you will be certainly uh, voting um, probably for the first time uh, to shape uh, the continent uh, that uh, you live in. This is something very, very uh, important. But then uh, coming back uh, to the skills that we need for the job market, um, uh, we see that uh, these are, there are some skills that are more and more uh, valuable nowadays. Uh, we uh, often hear uh, that your generation, so the youngest generation, is the most educated in history. I don't know if you have heard that already. This is an excellent news. Uh, and the trend is that fewer job are, uh, jobs are available for the lower skilled and uh, more jobs are available for people who are medium and highly skilled. Uh, the jobs uh, that don't require a lot of uh, skills uh, are very easy to automate and can be done by robots uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. And as we look around, we see that uh, technology is taking over uh, like uh, never before. I could mention, of course, uh, social media smartphones, but these are already old news. We need to take a look at what is currently ongoing. Uh, and when we speak about AI, uh, we are just scratching the surface. But definitely we need to, uh, to focus on that as well. Uh, besides this, um, I would uh, like to emphasize that um, interaction between humans and machines uh, this is what our committee is always saying and emphasizing, uh, that humans should always be in command when we speak about um, artificial intelligence, uh, digitalization as well. Um, but uh, is this transition uh, happening and how fast is it happening? Uh, we can see that uh, uh, 65 per uh, 66% of tasks uh, in organizations, in companies, uh, are still performed uh, by humans, and only some 34% uh, of tasks are performed uh, by machines. This is the reality nowadays. Uh, and uh, I would like to um, go on and discuss a little bit uh, in this direction and also to uh, forecast a little bit uh, 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 for the future with my two colleagues. Uh, and I would first likely, uh, like to present my colleague uh, sitting next to me, Mira Maria, and then uh, Sofia uh, Rizekar. Mira Maria is from Finland, uh, Sofia is from uh, Austria. And I would like to start uh, asking the first question to Mira Maria, uh, who is coming from a business organization, uh, and ask her about uh, her views uh, from an employer side on skills and uh, what skills are they looking for at the moment. Please. 
Thank you very much, Kinga, and a warm welcome also from my side to all of you. You really energized this committee in a way that I haven't uh, seen before. So indeed, I come from Finland and from an SME organization, so I'm defending the interest of small and medium-sized enterprises in Finland. Um, and of course, we are very much looking into the, the future of work and what kind of skills will be needed for the future. Um, if we go a couple of years back, uh, we could see quite a difficult situation in many parts of Europe where we saw a lot of uh, unemployment for, for youth. Um, but now, actually, the situation is improving. So we have more job openings uh, than actually people uh, applying for them. And we see this especially in, in some sectors uh, like healthcare, um, jobs like nurses, medical specialists, health technicians, uh, but also uh, in services sector like tourism, in restaurants, um, in construction as well. Uh, we have around 3% of jobs in Europe that are not filled in. Um, and this is quite a small number, but then when we look at the youth unemployment side, it's still higher uh, compared uh, to unemployment in the overall population. So this is, this is uh, quite uh, concerning and should not be the case. The good news is that um, in the next years, uh, in, I, I think um, especially in the next 10 years, we will have um, the sort of baby boomers generation, so I'm talking about my, my parents' generation, um, that will have retired and uh, we are expecting quite a lot of uh, job opportunities to be opened uh, from this generation when they are retiring. But of course you need to also have the right skills to apply for these jobs and be successful uh, in them. And our committee is working on this topic uh, a lot. What kind of skills do we need uh, for now and for the future? We know that the work life is changing rapidly, uh, so actually employers value um, employees with a pro proactive mindset uh, and with the capacity and openness to adapt and learn new skills. And what I think is essential to understand is that there is no going uh, back to the old world, and I often talk about this also uh, with my parents and their generation, when they would graduate uh, from education, um, they would immediately land a good job um, and stay there for the rest of their uh, lives until they retired. Um, but this is not the world anymore. So what I think is really important is to be able to adapt to this change, you know, up, adapt uh, yourself to this, you could call it uncertainty, um, but I would also call it as an opportunity to, to continue learning um, new things uh, on, uh, until the very end of, of work life. So actually what we need for this new type of uh, work uh, environment is uh, so-called meta skills. So these are, uh, I, I heard in the, in the opening session uh, the mentioning of superpower. I would also call these meta skill, skills a superpower. They are, uh, they are actually very useful skills for, for real life. Um, they are skills that you need in order to learn other skills, uh, to adapt to new situations and, and succeed no matter what life throws in your way. Uh, these skills are, for example, creativity, uh, collaboration, problem solving, empathy, and critical thinking. And also these meta skills are extremely useful if you decide to become an entrepreneur and we shouldn't always just think about becoming an employee and getting a job from a company. We need to be also um, more open to the idea that actually we can have an interesting career uh, by being an entrepreneur and, and starting our own businesses. Also, what I would still like to highlight is that digital skills are really essential. We will need to have better digital skills. We know uh, that nine out of ten jobs will require digital skills, uh, and at the same time, if we look at the situation now, uh, only uh, one-third of Europeans uh, between 16 and 74 years old uh, don't have basic digital skills. We will also need to have very specific skills, um, like machine learning, computing, uh, robotics, and this really emphasizes the need to study STEM disciplines, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, but also at the same time, with this trend, we see that employers 
are also um, appreciating the skills that are still very um, proper to human beings. Um, so analytical, creative thinking, flexibility, entrepreneurial spirit, this type of meta skills uh, that I just mentioned, because this is what is really essential for the human beings. Only we can do this. Machines cannot do this. So when we work together with AI, um, we, we will... Um, need these skills to, to make this uh, combination and collaboration with AI a, a success. Wow. Miramai, uh, that were uh, a lot of elements. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I would just uh, uh, kind of refer to what I said at the beginning, that you are the best uh, educated generation, uh, and you refer to the digital uh, skills, uh, that it's uh, um, um, uh, in, among young people it's uh, very uh, much... Uh, uh, the skills are present, uh, but you need to know, for example, the reality uh, for the adult population uh, in the EU that it's uh, only 54% uh, of the adult population have a basic digital skills according to the joint um, uh, employment report. So this really is a uh, big difference, a generational uh, difference. Uh, now, uh, I would like uh, uh, to ask you about uh, the future, to look into the future. Uh, and if you could uh, know, let us know uh, what you see there in terms of skills. Kinga does not um, ask easy questions. Um, I think many um, current jobs uh, that we, we have at the moment do not probably exist in the far future. Uh, there are speculations uh, saying that 85% of the jobs uh, that will exist in 2030 have not yet been invented. Yeah. And maybe, maybe if you think about it, actually, also the recent developments, um, for example, some years ago, no one thought that being uh, an influencer or playing PlayStation could bring you more money than, than being a doctor or an engineer. But it's, it's reality now. So we might very well see some interesting developments, new professions like uh, spacecraft pilots or cultured meat farmers um, that can be rather common positions um, in our future. But the predicting jobs and skills is not an easy uh, task, but uh, what is uh, for sure is that uh, we need our education systems and businesses teaming up and making sure that young people are learning um, the skills that are useful later on. And I am again highlighting um, that investing in the STEM disciplines uh, in the education sector just cannot go wrong. Um, these are also disciplines that actually can help us find uh, solutions to the fundamental challenges that we are facing globally, uh, such as climate change. And what would be a nicer way to, to work is, is you know, to, to be able to provide some solutions and mitigating our, our um, um, challenge for our planet. Um, I think I would still like to say that we should not think of an education as was kind of, I, I have to admit, it was, it was the way that I, when I was uh, going to university, that was the way that I was thinking, that I need a diploma. And, and I don't think this is the way that we should be thinking about uh, education. Um, I think we should be aim in learning something that is really useful for the society, not only for ourselves, but for the society. And... Um, I think we also have to accept that we will need to keep learning um, until the very um, end of our lives, um, even after we have retired. But this is really uh, such a nice thing, and it will lead uh, not only for a fulfilling career, but also a very fulfilling life. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mira Maria. And uh, indeed, I do agree, uh, coming from uh, civil society side, um, representing an association that besides the traditional teaching in, uh, uh, in school, uh, in VAT, uh, we can acquire uh, new competencies, new skills, uh, being active, for example, in associations, in a youth associations, uh, being a volunteer uh, uh, in um, uh, anywhere, uh, working for society. Uh, and this is called 
called informal learning. Uh, some of you might have already uh, known the, um, uh, this um, uh, expression. And it gives you skills that are very much appreciated uh, by employers. I hope you can uh, confirm that, uh, uh, Miriam Maria. And we will uh, exactly take a look at these skills as well in the game that is coming up um, in the second part of the workshop. Um, but now uh, I would like to turn to uh, Sofia, uh, who is uh, representing uh, trade unions, that is workers uh, from Austria. Uh, and um, uh, your country is famous uh, for uh, combining learning and working, um, and it is a very valued uh, practice. Uh, and I would like you to tell us a little bit more uh, about it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kinga. Um, so this dual system we have got, we also call it an apprenticeship uh, in Austria. And uh, when you're 14, you more or less are in the age to make a decision what kind of educational path you will take. And um, this is one of the paths that you may opt for. Um, and I've heard rumors that we have an Austrian champion of excellence here in the room, um, or we might have one. If there is what, can you make yourself known by raising the hand? Okay, a few over there. Is any one of you volunteering maybe to introduce in one minute what kind of job you did and um, what it actually is like to be in this dual system in, in Austria, so mixing theory, uh, so school and the practice in a company level? Anyone volunteering? They can do it in German. You can also do it in German, of course, no, no problem. So the others should put on their headphones in a case. Yeah, please, go on. Also... Um um, I'm talking in German. Also, als erstes, ich bin der Timo Nils Teisel. Ich freue mich, dort zu sein. Ähm, ich bin Platten- und Fliesenleger, habe in Danzig Gold gewonnen. Und ja, was war die Frage nochmal? <lacht> Um, wie das Lehrsystem bei uns funktioniert, also wie das für dich dann auch war, um, mit also Schule gehen, mit Ausbildung, also wie das funktioniert in Österreich, dass du vielleicht kurz erklärst. Also bei mir war ich bin quasi nach der Mittelschule, das war schon mein neuntes Schuljahr, weil ich in der Vorschule war, ich, habe ich meine Ausbildung angefangen, das war eine dreijährige Ausbildung, und, also die duale Ausbildung, also die Lehre quasi, und dort bin ich aber in Berührung, zu den Skillsberufen gekommen und dann hat mich das eigentlich immer schon interessiert und da war mein Arbeitgeber auch sehr interessiert und darum habe ich dann gesagt, das, da will ich mich messen mit dem und dann habe ich das gemacht. Okay. Danke schön. Okay. <lacht> Danke dir. Um, so you heard, uh, it took about three years. Um, so most of the, the um, trainings that the apprenticeships you can take is about three to four years. And um, you go to school for part of, the, those time, of this time. And you learn in school about the theory of the job. But you also have, um, for instance, machines where you can really train the, the knowledge that you got. And on the other hand, uh, you spend a lot of time in a company. So there are um, experts training you in the practice. You're already working. You're doing actually your job. And you also get remunerated for this job. So uh, you also earn a wage when you're um, um, 14, 15, 16 years old. And I went to high school and actually uh, I envied all of those people who opted for um, the dual system because they already had quite a lot of money um, at hand while I still had to go to my parents and back for some uh, pocket money. Um, so uh, when it comes to appreciating, to appreciating the, sorry, so when it comes to appreciating the mm -hmm. system, <laughs> Of course, there's a lot of prejudice um, when it comes to dual learning and people who opt for this, um, for this position, but we also heard this morning that with sh shop shortages, um, it's really important to have uh, this approach as well. They definitely deserve, nevertheless, a better image, um, and there is one thing I actually really want to highlight um, Reacting a bit to Mira Maria as well when she said at the beginning that there are some sectors, some jobs where um, we also have a, a labor shortage. And what we really see in Austria is, of course, there are some um, some sectors, for instance, in the tourism sector, um, where there would be a lot of opportunities to, be, to become an apprentice, to work in a hotel or in a restaurant, to learn and also to go to school. 
but people don't apply for this. And what we see that there is quite a strong link between working conditions and wages and the jobs uh, young people, but also grown-ups, of course, opt for. So this is my training perspective, of course, that when we speak about quality learning, we also need to speak about quality jobs that comes um, at the same time with quality wages. Um, and this is why we as trade unions are uh, really working on, on this as well. We negotiate wages for um, apprenticeships as well as we do for, for workers. We really push for the same rights for um, also worker representation of young people um, and that they afterwards can find a job that also matches their diplomas so that they can um, be, uh, remain in practice and also apply those things they learned in a good and quality job. Perfect, Sophia. I think these are uh, also very, very valuable uh, ideas about quality learning and quality jobs. Uh, um, uh, I like these uh, expressions a lot. And you also refer to uh, the diploma, or so to say, to the to the paper, to the certificate. So, how do you see nowadays? Uh, is it enough uh, to have this type of uh, paper diploma, or do we need? Uh, uh, how how would we make it, uh, a use of uh, of this uh, in the real world? Well, I think, first of all, uh, you need a diploma. So that's my experience. Without a diploma on the labor market, it's quite difficult to get jobs. Um, so whatever kind of diploma it is, it doesn't matter. It depends on the kind of job, of course, you're applying for. But having a diploma um, nowadays is important, but it definitely is not everything. Um, and uh, for once, every diploma you get, uh, it might, the job might change in the next few years. Um, so, for instance, in Austria... Um, um, we reintroduced actually a kind of a job that was lost for, for years and where we didn't have a dual system um, offering an apprenticeship. Um, and that's for blacksmiths doing the horseshoes because during the pandemic a lot of people started riding and uh, riding horses and uh, suddenly there was a need for more horseshoes and we had to reintroduce a really old-fashioned um, job profile when nobody would have expected them to, to be back in the labor market. Um, so some blacksmiths had to retrain and to refocus on the horseshoes again. Uh, so this is just one example where we can see that um, outdated skills can be relevant for the future, but that of course, and we spoke about digital skills and so on earlier, of course there will be a new, of, um, new challenges uh, and new tasks you need to fulfill. Um, and then there is something completely separate from the diploma, and there is a huge set of skills that you will never um, can show, that you will never be able to show with a diploma, and I think you know about those, the social skills, the so-called soft skills, um, and, uh, well, we heard about the superpowers earlier, of course, language skills, how to express yourself in your mother tongue or in, 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 um, in foreign tongues, um, but just a hint from my side, never expect um, excellency from yourself, so it's really fine not to be on the top list, um, but just be willing on a top list when it comes to grades. It's really um, okay to, just to have the diploma, to have a basic level of skills, to, spe to specialize on what you actually like to do, because when you have a passion about some, something, it's easier to obtain the, the skills you need as well, um, and then to go forward. But uh, it's not only a personal choice uh, to make, but um, it's also a structural question, and you need structures for lifelong learning as well. Um, and when you're already in a company, I think there's a lot of responsibility in the company side as well because they know what kind of skills they will need for the future. Um, and I expect that you also expect companies to have a plan um, and to assist you in learning, to tell you what kind of opportunities are out there to maybe even finance the, the, the learning process um, and to be a better fit for the jobs for the future. So um, this is the, the, the boring part. All of this isn't happening um, just because it would make sense. You need a lot of cooperation there. You will need the government involved. You will need the ministries of labor, of education, as well as the social partners or the companies, um, the, the trade unions, and also training centers, training providers to be involved to really set up a structure where you are enabled for the future to, to be involved, to get learning, to get training, um, and to have the right set for skills for the jobs now. now Nowadays, but also for the jobs that we will have in 2040, uh, which we don't know yet about. 
Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Sophia. Um, uh, and uh, now we will come to the um, uh, debate part um, uh, of this section if you have any questions uh, to us. Uh, but uh, first, uh, I would like to do uh, a very short summary of what you said in three words, what we need, uh, or what you need as a, as a young person, but also speaking about adults, because adult learning and adult education is also very important. So to me, uh, the three key words, uh, what we need is first, is diploma. Uh, that I, I can confirm. The second one was passion. I heard and I like very much this word, uh, that without passion uh, it's very hard to find uh, a job uh, that you really like. Uh, and the third one, uh, it's quite um, uh, hard to grasp, but this is the so-called uh, superpower. And then uh, I invite you to uh, argue with us or to agree with us uh, if you would like to now. Uh, for the debate part, you can uh, just uh, raise your hand if you have any questions, comments. Oh, sorry, uh, here in front. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for the floor. I'm Vidman Tasmitkus, representative of Lithuania. Uh, nice to be here. Um, I heard your discussions about a formal education perspective, skills and etc. Uh, but as we see, uh, skills is developed basically in informal learning, not in a formal education perspective, you know, in schools and etc. So, uh, how you think, how the schools should change, because as we see, the classrooms are basically the same as 30 years back. So uh, what is your perspective, what's your, your um, move, and how you see the classrooms, the subjects in the schools, which would be equal as the skills we need in 2030, for example, and etc. Thank you. Uh, I think this is an, an excellent question, and I will immediately give the floor uh, to the two discussants. Uh, discussants but uh, I would also uh, like to uh, mention, since uh, I finished the teacher's training uh, from university, uh, and at that time we were told uh, that uh, it's no matter what the subject is, but you need to teach the uh, children how to learn. So this is this is a basic skill, and this is uh, what good teachers uh, are trying uh, to do in schools: is to teach how to learn uh, and how to use uh, this skill uh, in their life. Uh, but please, uh, Mira. Thank you very much. It's an excellent question um, because it is true that our education systems are not. Uh, in many ways um, always up to date or able to respond to the needs uh, of the labor market. Um, so I think we need a lot of work there and I think what Kinga mentioned about um, the ability to learn, that, that's extremely important. Um, and I think we also need to uh, grasp the idea that, that we need actually not necessarily always these very long degrees where you sit for years uh, in, in an education institute, but also we need these smaller, we call them micro-credentials. So it can be a short course to, to update or teach you a new specific skill. Uh, so we, we need to use this diversity that also the digitalization allows us with the new digital training tools to, to um, uh, develop and, and provide skills for young people. I think also um, we have a lot and lot of of opportunities uh, for online learning and and um, I have a have a friend who is doing a university uh, degree at the moment um, and he told me that he actually learned because because the lectures weren't apparently of very high quality so he learned. Uh, much more from an online learning tool. So he had to go after the courses. He had to go to to do his own uh, learning online. But of course, this is just one case. Uh, so I think uh, I, I couldn't generalize this, but this is just to say that um, the ability to learn and, and really understand that there are also other sources of, of learning tools and information out there, uh, that's uh, really a key. Um, just a few um, keywords. I think on the one hand, you need to overwork some curriculums, so they're quite old-fashioned, as you said, um, and update them. Uh, 
digital skills, of course, is one of the um, easy ones to state, but um, depending on the job or on the kind of diploma you're reaching for, I think you need to, re to introduce new kind of, of subjects uh, into the curriculum and also to have more flexible curriculum. Um, so in my school, I had no choice at all, pretty much. So everything was predetermined what I had to do. Um, and I think it, uh, the, the pupils as well as the teachers could profit if there was more flexibility, if um, you could focus on things you uh, would like to, to uh, yeah, but where you've got an interest, um, but also um, to be more flexible when there is an issue coming up that you can react uh, to it. Um, but then it's also about methods, uh, and also, although it was quite old-fashioned in my school days, um, there were a lot of things I hated, of course, such as group works um, or doing presentations, but in the end, uh, going through life, being later on university, being um, in a job now, uh, those are actually the skills that I apply most, so I don't need... Um, my mathematics or the biology, but um, learning from how to balance a group, how to get input from somebody who doesn't really like to be involved, or um, what I did for presentations, what worked well, what didn't work that well, are actually those soft skills uh, that really help me nowadays. And I think this is a question of methods um, in schooling that, that really matter as well. Any other questions from the floor? Or shall we start? Yes. Oh! Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Enrique. I'm from. My name is Enrique. I'm from Portugal, along with, with my colleagues. Uh, my question is: Looking at the website of the European Commission, it states there that the first principle of the European pillars of social rights is the right of quality, inclusive education, training, and lifelong lifelong learning. My question is, what is exactly lifelong learning and how can we promote this? Thank you. Okay, good question. And since we had more questions, I will uh, collect and then maybe we can uh, respond uh, in the same time. In the back, please, gentlemen. Hello, my name is Levanta Fazakas from Hungary. My question is, uh, would it be a great idea or a bad idea to get involved AI to learn in elementary or middle schools? Any more questions that we can collect? Okay, please. Hello. And I would like to see some ladies as well asking questions. Sorry. <laughs> Not only responding. Hello, my name is uh, Peter. I am from Romania. And uh, my question is, um, in my uh, country, in your case, a lot of uh, empaths is uh, placed on theory and diploma not actually what, what you know and what you can do. And uh, my question is, uh, what do you actually know and what do you want to do for this to, um, to correct that thing? Thank you. Okay, theory versus practice. Good question. Also, there was a question on AI. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Hello, my name is Tanya Herceg. I'm from Croatia, Impress organization that is working mostly in rural areas of uh, Croatia. Uh, and I have a question. Uh, when we are talking about uh, skills for future, uh, it's always uh, like uh, more concentrated also on areas that are like more urbanistic because still schools, not only in Croatia, but everywhere in Europe, we have areas that unfortunately some Kids, some young people in schools even don't have transportation to reach modern techniques. And then the gap between young people that have approach to, uh, to different uh, equipment and young people that are in rural areas are even bigger and bigger. And that's like smaller chances for these young people to uh, even compete equally. So gap is getting bigger. Uh, what is your opinion about it? What are, what, um, are your steps about it? And uh, is there some like, concrete plans how it can be like, more equal? Thank you. Thank you very much. Also a very good question. Uh, any more uh, from the floor? Because uh, this is 
why we are here. Uh, so uh, I would just like uh, to summarize very, very shortly. We had a question on lifelong learning uh, and the European pillar of social rights, um, uh, right to education, basically. Um, uh, then uh, we had a question on AI in uh, primary and uh, secondary uh, education, very interesting uh, one. Uh, then we had a, a question uh, from uh, uh, Romania uh, about theory and practice uh, and also this urban uh, rural divide. Uh, uh, in education. So I would like to give the floor. Uh, who would, uh, would you like to start first? Uh, Maria? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, to start from, from the question about lifelong learning, well, essentially, it is exactly the answer to these stiff education systems uh, because uh, the work life as I also mentioned in my first intervention, it is not the same how it used to be that you would go to a job, you would stay there for 20 years and then you would retire or 30 years. Um, so we need to constantly update our skills because we also have um, developments, especially in the digital and technical sphere where um, that require us to update our skills. So, so it's really about after uh, also um, the formal education when you when you go to work life that you keep learning in workplace. You keep uh, doing also um, um, activities that that uh, increase your skill set and and so that you are also when when you change your jobs you are also uh, fit for the work life um in the long term um then i would maybe say about the ai i think the ai in elementary schools i mean it, it re really depends what we mean by ai but i think ai in general will be uh, and should be everywhere in our uh, education systems um, because it actually can provide quite some tools for us to also improve our learning experiences. Um, I think I think this we shouldn't uh, we should see it as an opportunity uh, because, for example, when we improve our learning experiences uh, via AI tool, uh, that can actually make the learning so much more fun. Um, and actually, because the, the personal feeling about what the learning is about is really important. If we have a very negative feeling about um, the learning experience itself, if we find it very complicated and we don't understand why it's so difficult to understand something that we are being taught to, um, it actually creates a barrier for any future learning. So I think, therefore, we should look at AI, especially from the perspective of uh, improving our learning experiences. Um, then... Um, Going to the uh, question about the diploma um, and theory. Uh, yes, in, in Europe we are very much uh, diploma and, and theory oriented in many ways. I would just look at the diploma as sort of a proof for your employer that actually you were able to follow up, you were able to finish something. That's a proof that, that actually you didn't give up, you didn't let go although there were some topics that you weren't, weren't interested about or although it was a bit boring at some point, whatever reason. But, but you actually, you, uh, you were following up on, on the diploma and you finished it. That's the proof that I would say uh, that it provides for employer um, more even than, than the content that you learned. So I think we still need diploma, some sort of certification that, that you, you were actually able to follow through and you are able to also in work life follow through uh, the assignments and the position that you have taken up. And then um, the last question uh, was really, um, really good question and quite uh, difficult uh, to answer. I think uh, also the, the vocational education systems are uh, providing some answers to the issues for more um, um, er, um, rural areas um, and uh, also provide answers for the more, uh, let's say, traditional skills. Um, but maybe at this point, I would give it to my colleague to, to uh, complement. Sorry, that's creaking a bit. Um, 
Well, then I will stay, st start off with um, this urban-rural question. Um, I think there are many factors that influence your, your decision, what kind of job you're going to take, what kind of education opportunities you have, um, and this definitely is uh, whether you grew up in, in a city or in, in a rural area. Of course, and there is also the matter of, of your parents. So what we really see in Austria is that when your parents got a university degree, there is a much, much higher chance that you get one um, uh, than when your parents uh, did not. So um, there are a lot of factors uh, that really influence your individual um, opportunities. Um, and this is now the whole, this is whole politics. This is not really one easy, um, um, easy answer to all of that. But uh, especially when looking to uh, the rural question, I think we need investment. We need investment in infrastructure. Um, so on the one hand, de decentralizing um, education, education centers, um, but also enabling mobility of people so that it's easier to get from um, your home village to uh, the next village or to the next town where uh, you can get the training or where can you can go to school and I know that uh, this is uh, not possible in most of the areas in, 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 in Austria as well and definitely not in, in Europe. So yeah, to me one of the answers here is investment um, and we would need to invest a lot um, and this is a question of the future and the next European Parliament for sure. Um, <clears throat> Then uh, moving on to Romania and the question of theory and diplomas. Um, so coming back to, to the Austrian system with having the theory in school and the practice in, in the company, um, I think this really helps to uh, work on your, or your skills uh, on a practical level. And you're doing the training in this company for the three or four years and um, there is quite a high chance that you will stay or that you can stay in the company. So there is a job open for you um, to get started in this company, but of course you can apply to other companies as well. Um, and uh, there is not only the diploma in the end that, that counts, but also what you have learned, what you can do. Um, and uh, the mobility in the labor market is, is better, therefore. Uh, so it's definitely not the answer to everything, but uh, I think when we have this combination from theory and the practice, that, that definitely helps that we don't have only the, the theory focus uh, that is, uh, sometimes we are stuck in. Um, when it comes to elementary and the middle school, I'm definitely not an expert. Uh, I think artificial intelligence is something um, that can be everything and nothing, um, and we need to explore what's um, actually of use um, for what kind of age. I think everybody should be raised in an awareness uh, what can be done via uh, artificial intelligence, um, but also where are the limits. Uh, we need to explore um, what opportunities there are and uh, also where to be skeptical and that we can't believe everything that the artificial intelligence, for instance, tells us looking at ChatGPT and, and so on. So I think this is something, um, so being, uh, having critical thinking um, is actually the skill I would focus on here. But AI tools um, definitely can and should be used uh, and we definitely need qualified teachers uh, for that as well. I think this is one of the huge, uh, for the largest obstacles here. And coming back to the first question, lifelong learning, Miri Maria has already answered quite a lot, so just a few keywords there. Um, retraining, for instance, is part of lifelong learning. So when you lose a job, you say, okay, actually, I don't want to do this job anymore. Um, I want to do something completely else. I want to go into the care system, for instance. Is there an opportunity to do retraining, to be 30 years old and say, I want to do something different? So um, this would be one example for lifelong learning. Um, then, of course, um, lifelong learning in your job because your job profile is, is um, changing. You need new, a new set of skills so that in the company uh, there are opportunities to get those skills that you need. Um, and then, of course, to get another diploma. Um, with a dual system learning in Austria, you also have the opportunity to, to get a high school diploma. Um, so you can uh, work in your job and after a few years maybe decide that you actually want to go to university as well and to add to your practical um, experience more of the theoretical um, um, experience or um, input because something changed and then you also have the opportunity to go to university. So to be a bit more, um, to have more mobility in the labor market and also in the education system is also one of the aspects of lifelong learning that I would like to highlight. Perfect. 
Thank you also. Uh, thank you both, uh, Mira Maria and uh, Sofia. Uh, I hope you found uh, this discussion uh, interesting. Uh, but now time is passing very quickly, so we should turn uh, to the game session. I think you're all uh, looking forward to that. For this, uh, we will, uh, uh, you will be divided in, into uh, smaller groups. I would just like to announce uh, for the interpreters, since we will be working in smaller groups, uh, that we will say uh, goodbye to them uh, because it's impossible to uh, interpret uh, small group discussions. So thank you very much for your work. And uh, I uh, invite uh, for this uh, second part for the game, uh, we have uh, Maria Alvova from the European Training Foundation who will give uh, ex explanations on how this is working. But we also have uh, Pauline uh, from Lifelong Learning Platform. And I thought that when we had the question on lifelong learning, maybe you can go around uh, and discuss a little bit with the participants uh, what this uh, really mean for you. So, but please, now you have the floor. Thank you. Indeed, I will say a few words about lifelong learning uh, in my presentation. Um, so, good morning, everyone. My job uh, is to represent civil society. So, even if you're in the house of civil society, uh, I don't know how much uh, you know about what it is. I mean, uh, my job is uh, complicated. Even my friends don't understand what I do. Uh, so... Uh, it might be a very new world for you. Um, what we are, we are organized the civil society. So we are an organization that represents the citizens. And the way I can put it is that uh, it's a little bit like trade union, but we represent um, all citizens, the learners. That is you, everyone. Um, it's maybe not very easy for you to understand what we do here, uh, so I will try to make it very short um, and also leave time for the game because I think you're all here for that. You want to have fun, so um, I will be very short. So my organization uh, promotes lifelong learning, uh, and that means we promote lifelong learning from early childhood to uh, senior education, so that is... Uh, one aspect of lifelong learning, but I, I also like to uh, add that we promote life-wide learning, meaning that you learn in formal, non-formal, and informal education. Uh, formal education being school, university. Non-formal can be work-based learning, um, can be uh, learning in the youth sector, and etc. And informal learning is learning with your family and your friends, or on YouTube. Uh, that can happen. And you know that you learned, uh, as it was also mentioned earlier, uh, you learn a lot of things outside school. And one of these things is um, transversal competencies or the soft skills, uh, whatever you can call it. Uh, and you can see in this, uh, in this uh, visual presentation uh, what kind of skills you can acquire. And most of these skills are actually acquired outside school, so you can gain uh, self-management skills like working efficiently, uh, being proactive, you can learn social and communication skills like supporting others, uh, leading others, and so on, thinking skills, physical and manual skills in all the financial, environmental, uh, cultural, civic, and health areas. Um, and those skills are very good. Uh, because these skills, you don't need to update them constantly. It's not like AI, robotics, and this kind of thing that you always need to learn how to work with a computer. Transversal skills are fond foundational skills, which you can only improve in life, usually. And not only you can use it in your job, in, in your education, but you can also use it in your life, uh, in your personal life. Like, for instance, let's take financial skills. Maybe your job is uh, you have to do some mathematics, statistics, you have to use numbers. But also in your home, you need to be able to manage a budget. So it's actually useful in many areas of your life. The thing is that school, um, the thing is that school don't really assess those skills, don't really, well, don't train you, but also don't assess those skills. So what can you do about it? So, yeah, do you have what we call invisible competencies. Did you learn yourself a competencies over your mentor, on the job, in volunteering, on YouTube, with your family? Uh, but uh, how do you show the employer that you have the skills? How do you assess your level? 
And uh, in my short, very short presentation, I want to talk to you about the concept of validation because it's a way that you can make all learning visible, you can make all learning valued, and all your competencies are visible. So validation is a process in, uh, in which you can make visible the competencies that you acquired in non-formal and informal learning. And how do you validate competencies? So there are four steps. First, you identified those competencies and the way that you can do it, among others, is a self-assessment questionnaire. Uh, after that, you document your skills. So you can uh, create a portfolio with, I don't know, your graphic designer, you show what you designed and you add it to your portfolio. Then you assess them, test an exam, and then you can certificate, uh, get a certificate, a diploma, or as you mentioned, micro-credential. That is a new trend which is emerging for short learning experience. And what is it important to validate those, all the skills? Well, of course, it is uh, gain uh, an added value for your uh, employability, but it's also good for social inclusion. You feel more integrated in society. If you feel more confident in yourself, it's good for your personal development. Uh, and to be aware of all the ability that you have, especially, I mean, there are young people that don't have necessarily a diploma, but they have a lot of competencies. You know, it's very important for them to make them visible. And where can you do that? Well, it all depends on your country. Uh, there's no, yeah, uh, no one rule on that. You can go to a validation center in Belgium, in France, they, they have it a lot. Uh, you can go to a career guidance center. You maybe heard about skills audit. This is one way that you can um, identify the skills. Also, in some countries, uh, like in Lithuania, you can go to a vocational center. They do validation. Uh, in other countries, you can go out to adult education, university, and also some NGOs, uh, volunteering-based organizations, they can do that as well. So yeah, finally, if you want to learn more about how to validate transversal competencies, you can uh, go on these uh, web pages or LinkedIn. If you want to learn more about civil society and the work that we do here at Europe, and you can go and meet us at the stand uh, on the floor five, uh, this number 5.5. .5. Uh, and now uh, I will just close my presentation and uh, leave time for the game. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Maria. I have absolutely unpronounceable surname, so just call me Maria, that's, that's enough. Um, I work for the European Training Foundation, ETF. ETF is an EU agency based in Italy. And we work with countries neighboring European Union to help them to reform their education system. So the education actually provides competences to young people that young people will use then on the labor market. Today we will play the game called Scaffold. That's, that's the game. Um, Scaffold was developed by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and European Training Foundation. It was developed mainly as a tool for teachers educators and people that decide about the content of learning. You know, there was a question today about how can we make sure that our teaching, our teachers remain, you know, up front of, of, of all the changes. So that's the tool that was created for teachers. I want to play with this tool with all of you. Um, and just to explain, the tool consists of 102 cards. I have some of them here just to show you. Um, these cards, they cover main competences. They cover competences from different fields. For instance, this one is digital. So all the competences you need to have to navigate the digital technologies nowadays. There is another one, for instance, which entrecomp, entrepreneurial competences, which not only mean that these are the competences that you need to set up a business, but they are also the competences that you need to be entrepreneurial in your life, to run a project to set a task on, in your career, okay? Now, um, we need to split in groups. I really need to ask your help to do that. We need to split in groups. I, I think I have some people that will help me, some colleagues. Um, first of all, please, for every group, you have to decide who will be the speaker. And just to tell you, it would be amazing if the speaker could be an English speaker because just to facilitate the process of communication. And also, the best speakers of the best groups will receive some presents, just to make uh, it a bit more interesting. Um, so you will be receiving an envelope like this. In every envelope, one group will get one envelope. You will get the cards. 
I will show them to you. Okay? Your task is to rate them. So what are the competences most important for your career? It doesn't matter that if you find a new job, if you want to change job, if you want to make an, an outstanding career. What competences will be the most important for your career? Rank them from the top one to the last one. There will be five competences. I don't want to hear answers. All of them are important. <laughs> Those are not accepted. You really have to rank them. And also, together with the cards, you will receive a piece of paper with the question I just did. So what are the competences are the most important for your career? And also, why? So not only the ranking, but the why. I want you to discuss it in group. You discuss it. You come back with the ranking and with the explanation. Is it clear? Any questions? Okay. So, yeah, go. Yes, do you mean a career in general, like for everyone or just ours? Because, for example, we're studying... I mean, obviously you will be using your personal experience, and that's okay, absolutely yeah. fine. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. But you need to get to the agreement. That's also, you know, a, a civil society part of this organization. We need to have agreement between all of you and the ranking. More questions? No. Okay, then... Maybe we can have rows, several rows together. No, they will be done I hope I woke them up, it's like, you shake them. It's a difficult exercise in this setup. Really. I think that's okay. No, I think that's okay. You have 10 minutes, please be quick. Split into groups, no matter the size. I hope you're already discussing the competences. Yep. <laughs> to take a picture. It's an impossible challenge.
One minute left. Please prepare the ranking and the why and instruct the speaker. The time is over. The time is over. Please take your seats. This is our plan. Okay. There is one group still discussing. Guys, are you ready? Ready? It was a difficult conversation for us too, eh? It was very difficult to, to prioritize, to have a ranking. Ready, no? Okay. So, <laughs> so I will start with the first group, maybe you know, who is the speaker from your group? Ah, uh, hello. <laughs> yes, you can speak from the microphone, but please put on the microphone because uh, otherwise we can't hear. So what was the, your first skill? Um, so, um, so first of all, our group uh, made a very simple decision, I guess, because we were on the track, you know, and etc. So our first one is uh, growth mindset. Growth mindset. Let, yeah. let me interrupt you here. Any other group has growth mindset and any other group decided it's a top one? No. Then we really want to hear the reasons why from your group. Yeah, because, because we understand it as a core of everything. Um, when you develop your mindset and etc., you can think positively, negatively and etc. But you're looking into some kind of learning uh, uh, perspectives, experiences and etc. So we think that's the core. Uh, when you develop your mindset in the right way. Question. Do yeah. you think education can help you develop the growth mindset? Um, and yes and no, because it depends on informal learning, formal learning, and etc. Informal setup. Do yeah. you think your yeah. you know, formal education really help you to develop it? No, no, no. Formal, no. no informal. Formal. Informal, yeah. Okay. Second skill. <laughs> Second skill, uh, vision. Vision. Yeah. Can you please write the, um, read the description? Imagine the f this one. Imagine the future to help guide effort and turn ideas into action. Anyone else has the vision in the top? Okay, so we hear your reasons and then we go to the, to the other group. Go. Oh, okay, so uh, there was a good explanation by the colleague. You, uh, first of all, you need to think, uh, th think about it and see it to develop it. So that's the vision. So you speak about vision of the career, the progression, the yeah. pathway that you can follow. And, and I think, for example, if you're creating your own business, you need to you know, sure. sleep with that idea to know what is that. Live with it, not yeah. only sleep with it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course, why not? Okay, let's go to another group that selected vision. Huh? Yes. Uh, yes, please. Why vision? 
Okay, we have vision on um, place number one. And first of all, I would like to thank my group. I'm speaking here on behalf of a Latvian uh, group. Uh, many youngsters are here. And yeah, we set a vision or we placed vision to number one because we say that it's the overarching, uh, what we want to achieve and every other skill is um, working on that set goal. Mm -hmm. Do you think we all have a vision? When we start our career? Um, no, and the path to, that, uh, to achieve the vision can be, of course, flaky or shaky, um, and it will become clearer, possibly, and there might be different uh, ways to achieve it. Um, but no, it's not clear from the start, and I think, um, as a former teacher myself, and also as a youth worker myself, so non-formal learning is presented here as well, I think we should equip um, youngsters to um, work on their visions for life and work, so lifelong learning. And do you think it's already happening in formal education? Depends. I see a lot of people saying no. Okay. It depends. I try okay. to do it as my... Yeah. Okay. So for your first one is vision, second one for your group. Um, for the uh, second one, we chose coping with uncertainty and ambiguity and risk. Okay, just a second. Is there anyone else who decided that coping with uncertainty, and I must say in these times, that's the skill. Uh, is there anyone else who believes it's important, who put it in the top of the ranking? No. Okay, so why did you put it for... The second one. Yeah, I can quote you. You just said it, Maria. Um, so it is in our days, um, what is certain? Um, will it be certain if I start a career path that I will work in that? Mm -hmm. um, so, and especially to reach our vision, we really have to have the skill. Okay, excellent. Um, I want to pick another group, maybe the one that is there. Yes, what is your first top skill needed for the career? Okay, so I'm talking on behalf of Croatians and Hungarians. Mm -hmm. We decided after a long debate to put uh, communication and negotiation skills on the top because we think that communication is needed in every aspect of the job. It's something that makes the job possible and it's something that's needed even if you are a leader or a follower mm -hmm. in the job. Also, it's good because you learn it through education, but also through life, I think, especially in negotiating skills that you learn through both verbal and nonverbal communication. So it's something that I think everyone possesses, just needs to maybe work a bit more or sometimes less on it, but it's really needed for every aspect. Okay. So it was a definite pre priority. So us. you had no, no discussions about it? Communication yeah, is tough. Yeah, we put it on the, on okay. the spot immediately. Um, anyone else? Spoke about communication, put it in top three. No. Oh, okay, now I'll, I'll come back, I'll come back to that group. Okay, second one. The second one was growth mindset because we believe that uh, it's also really needed to be optimistic and to turn toward the goal rather than maybe accepting a defeat and starting to work towards something because I don't think, we mm -hmm. don't think that you can work if you don't believe that it's going to be a success. Mm -hmm. So it's really needed like as an internal push for people. Excellent. Now, we go, we take communication from you and we go to another group. So over there, why you decided that communication is important for career? Okay. Uh, we decided that the communication is the most important at all. So um, uh, if we um, saw the cards, it was our, our first choice, and uh, we are uh, different types of jobs, but uh, uh, um, we decided um, in one voice that the communication is um, as at ours first. Mm -hmm. uh, second one for you? Learning through experience. Excellent, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, we have still, uh, I think, two groups maybe over there, but we haven't listened. What are your priorities? What top one? Sorry, uh, top one is planning and management. Okay. Because uh, we are thinking that uh, journey way plan is always more efficient. Mm -hmm. Where do you learn that? Where do you learn planning and management? I think we could start to learn it in school in a kind of way, but. Do you think schools are doing a good job in providing those, in, in training you to do those skills? I'm yeah. Not really sure. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Second one for your group? And the second one is critical thinking. Critical thinking. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Anyone else has critical thinking? Yeah, perfect. Go. Yeah, we had um, critical thinking as our first skill, and it was people and planning and management as the second skill. Uh -huh. um, we found that the critical thinking uh, will, is the most important one because you need to obviously establish what is the main priority for you then to manage and plan out the remainder of the works. Okay, and uh, the second one you said was? Uh, planning and management. Planning and management, okay. Yeah. Uh, any other group that we haven't listed yet at the top? Yeah, go. Uh, basically, we have the same with the guy before me. Uh, the, as the first one, uh, critical thinking, and the second, the second one, uh, planning and management. So basically, okay. the critical thinking is because you have to think outside the box, so you can. Okay. Okay. Your thoughts Excellent. Clear. So we have a couple of uh, yeah coincidences yeah. And here. And then you have to manage them. Somehow. Okay. Excellent. More groups that haven't presented their top skills. Well, there, there is one group, which is this one in the panel. And I must say we had quite a conversation uh, because we had ve very much difficulty in picking the top one. But that was the task. We couldn't have all of them in the top. So we ended up with two top, and then I'll tell you which one we decided is the top. Analytical, I think it was mentioned already right now. And then taking the initiative, because of course, if you're sitting down on your couch doing nothing, nothing will happen in your career, no? And I think we even have voted. <laughs> and I think analytical skills has won, because in a way we felt that you need to understand, analyze, to be able to analyze what you see, what you face, in order to build your career. So that was a very brief but intense discussion. Now, question is, why should you matter? Why those competences that we discussed today? Why bother? Um, when you speak to many employment experts, many of them say that we know nothing about the labor market in 2030, and this is tomorrow. This is really in six years' time. We all still be in the labor market in 2030. What we know already is that we will all have to change, and I think it was mentioned by the previous panel, we will all have to change jobs, change professions several times in our lifetime. All of us, all present in this room. So we will have to keep learning continuously. That's going to be a must. And uh, we will have to be acquiring no, those competences and improving them because, of course, you can acquire a competence. Okay, I know what is communication but I need to improve. And this improvement process will last for a lifetime. Um, and actually, this learning is not going to be so much about technical skills, but this learning is going to be about all those competences that we discussed today, about transversal competences, about learning to learn, about critical thinking. There is yet another big, massive factor, and I think there was an excellent question today about it, artificial intelligence. There are different estimations, but we know that a lot of jobs will be destroyed. We know that a lot of jobs will change completely. Now, how can we stay competitive with these changes coming on us? We need to adapt, and we need to reinvent ourselves. There is no doubt the AI revolution will touch every single person present in this room. And to remain relevant, we have to become masters of those transversal competences, of those competences we discussed today, critical thinking, communication. So if you want to improve your learning trajectory, if you want to really know what you have to improve in order to build a successful career, Scaffold could be a good tool. Thank you. Yes, by the way, speakers of each group, please pass by you will have your individual scaffold waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the money. Uh, so everyone is invited to the lunch uh, outside in uh, uh, Atrium. Please join the others. And thank you very much for your participation. Yeah.